to move. Can you take that? <laughs> There's a lot going on up here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, with apologies for our late start. Um, but thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome council members Rodriguez, Cornegy, uh, Dr. Eugene, council member King, um, council member Gredenchek, Danny Drum, council member Drum, former chair of the Committee on Education. Um, of course, we'll hear opening statements from council member Traeger, chair of the Committee on Education, council member Barron, chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and I want to welcome Council Member uh, Ali Gamper Samuel as well. Have I missed anyone? No. Good afternoon and welcome to our oversight hearing on Title IX and gender discrimination in New York City schools. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Today I am joined by Council Member Traeger and Council Member Barron. Thank you for your leadership in co-chairing this very important hearing. Before we begin, I do want to recognize that this is the first hearing for the Committee on Women and Gender Equity since our committee's name was amended to include the term gender equity. Gender identities, according to their, um, gender equity means fairness of treatment for all sexes, genders and gender identities according to their respective needs. This name change better reflects the committee's work and focus, which aspires to be a part of the fight for justice and rights for all. As education is meant to be our great equalizer, it is fitting that our first hearing will consider how gender discrimination can be an obstacle to achieving educational uh, potential in our schools. Gender discrimination in school is real. It creates an environment that is not conducive to learning for anyone. Title IX protections extend beyond unequal access to sports teams and facilities or too few girls enrolled in advanced science courses. Sex discrimination also includes, but not limited to, being subjected to street harassment on the way to or from school, being mocked for dressing the wrong way, being denied an accommodation should a student become a parent, being exposed to crude images, or being the victim of a sexual assault. Research shows that consequences under these circumstances are dire. A decline in grades coupled with an increase in absenteeism with some students dropping out of school altogether. There are obvious mental health implications as well. Title IX of the Education uh, Amendments Act of 1972 is meant to protect students from discrimination based on sex and education programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. Under the Obama administration, there were efforts to increase and strengthen protections for students, including guidance clarifying Title IX protections for LGB and transgender and gender nonconforming students and on the number of Title IX coordinator staff required in larger school districts. The Trump administration wants to unwind these protections. In addition to the Dear Colleague letters that rescinded the Obama era guidance last year, US Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos released a new proposed Title IX rule which, if passed, could be devastating for students. These proposed changes will be described in full throughout the hearing, but I believe that DeVos's proposal is unconscionable. If enacted, the new rule would undermine critical protectors, protections for survivors of sexual violence, disproportionately harm LGBT female identifying and gender nonconforming students, and have a serious chilling effect on the reporting and adjudication of sex discrimination. 
The misogyny and transphobia on the federal level requires le localities to lead in protecting our students. Is New York City prepared for this task? Does one Title IX coordinator position at DOE have a meaningful presence in our schools with over 1.1 million students? Are other staff addressing Title IX issues? I know we'll hear about that today. Can the City Council be helpful in passing legislation and advocating for more funding? Chicago, with a school system of about 360,000 students, has 20 Title IX coordinators as part of its Office of Student Protections and Title IX team. A third the population of our city and 20 Title IX coordinators. We must shine a spotlight on sex and gender discrimination in our schools. It's our responsibility not only to carry on the legacy of the original Title IX protections and the Obama updates, but to build on the knowledge and experience that we've gained and to expand upon not limit protections. To that end, I'm proud to sponsor legislation being heard by the committee today. Introduction 1536 is a proposed local law which would expand the Commission on Gender Equity's annual report to include reporting on Title IX. This report should bolster CGE's work by informing the public of New York City's efforts to best address sex discrimination in schools and by providing a blueprint for best practices through Title IX compliance. At this hearing, we expect a comprehensive vision for such a blueprint from our New York City officials on how Title IX works to protect our students. In particular, I'm very interested in hearing about the work of the Sexual Health Education Task Force, the Department of Education's Gender Equity Liaison, or GEL, and the 16 Days of Activism. I also look forward to hearing directly from students, advocates, uh, their lawyers, and interested stakeholders about their experiences with Title IX in New York City. I'm grateful for your participation both at the rally before this hearing and your testimony today. Before turning the mic over to Chair Traeger for his remarks, I'd like to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well as the Committee on Women and Gender Equity staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney to my left, who is our general counsel, Chloe Rivera, our, legisl our legislative policy analyst, and Monica Papel, our finance analyst. They've done extraordinary work. I urge you to read the committee report on this hearing. I'll turn it over now to Chair Traeger. Thank you, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for being here today for this important joint hearing of the Committees on Women and Gender Equity, Education, and Higher Education. My name is Councilmember Mark Traeger, and I am Chair for the Committee on Education. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to note the Committee will hear an important resolution of which I'm proud to be a, a prime co-sponsor. This is Resolution 797 by Councilmember Adams, which calls upon the New York City Department of Education to maintain at least uh, seven Title IX coordinator positions with at least one coordinator at each borough field support center. Currently, DOE has only one dedicated Title IX coordinator working out of central headquarters for the entire New York City school system, which is the largest school district in the United States with over 1.1 million students. Since Mayor de Blasio has taken office, the sanitation department's number of civilian employees has increased by a third, DCAS by 20%, and the city information technology department by over more than 50%. There are now nearly 345,000 full-time city employees. Throw in part-time employees, and we are almost 400,000 employees. Resolution 797 is only calling for the addition of seven very important employees seven people who are visible and accessible to students, educators, and the public. 
seven people equipped to effectively identify, respond to, and prevent sex discrimination as well as gender stereotyping and sexual violence. As highlighted by Chair Rosenthal, Title IX prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance and applies to elementary and secondary schools as well as colleges, universities, and trade schools. Under Title IX, all school district or educational institutions receiving federal financial assistance must designate at least one employee, generally referred to as the Title IX coordinator, to coordinate efforts to comply with and carry out their responsibilities under Title IX. Like many advocates, I am concerned about DOE's ability to effectively carry out the responsibilities under Title IX, as the system has just one coordinator for its 1.1 million students. This form of protection from sex, uh, sexual discrimination and sexual violence is important for our city students and staff. One Title IX coordinator is not nearly enough to serve the largest school system in the entire country. DOE must be more robust in their efforts to protect New York City students. I'm going to share with you some very sobering figures from the New York State Education Department's VADER, or Violent or Disruptive Incident Reporting, and DASA, Dignity for, for All Students Act, incident reports. These are stats from 2016-2017. There were 4,105 cases of discrimination, harassment, and bullying, excluding cyberbullying. There were 26 reported cases of forcible sex offenses and there were 2,604 cases of other sex offenses. For 2017, 2018, we've seen all these figures increase. There were 6,437 cases of discrimination, harassment, and bullying, again, excluding cyberbullying. There were 456 forcible sex offenses. There were 3,069 cases of other sex offenses. We need more Title IX coordinators. In addition, we also lack adequate social and emotional supports. More than 700 New York City schools lack a full-time social worker. 700 New York City schools lack a full-time social worker. That's nearly half of our schools. We need to do better for our students. Our students need and deserve more social and emotional supports. DOE's Chances Regulation A831 sets forth procedures for filing, investigating, and resolving complaints of student-to-student -student sexual harassment at the school level. I am particularly interested in how DOE is tracking and following up with reported complaints and how they are ensuring that students are aware of their rights and the resources available to them pursuant to this regulation. I was alarmed when I learned about the proposed Title IX changes from our country's federal education department. The proposed changes would undoubtedly make our city's school environments less safe. Under the federal government's proposed changes, one incident would not be sufficient for a school to respond to a sexual harassment complaint unless it was severe enough to deny access to education programs or activities. This means that even the youngest students would have to endure repeated incidents of sexual harassment until it was determined that such incidents rose to the severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive standard necessary to deny equal access to the school's education program or activity. Further, under the proposed regulations, a school's obligation to respond to an allegation of sexual harassment is only triggered if the school has actual knowledge of sexual harassment or allegations, meaning that it, that it was reported to the correct person, which can be a Title IX coordinator, a teacher at the, at the school, or an official with authority to take corrective action. This ignores the fact that sexual harassment and assault are personal issues that are difficult to talk about, and for many students, the adult they trust to reveal a disturbing incident to may be a coach, family assistant, school aide, power professional, or other non-teacher or administrator. So this proposed change would make reporting of sexual harassment more difficult and confusing and reduce the likelihood 
that such incidents are reported at all. Another proposed change states that the, the alleged harassment must have occurred within the school's own program or activity in order for the school to be required to respond. So incidents that occur while students are walking to or home from school would be excluded from consideration as would attacks that occur via social media, despite the fact that such off-campus incidents can and do impact students' education. I certainly look forward to hearing from the DOE about their efforts to do what is necessary to not only meet the letter of the law, but its spirit. Understanding changes could be made, I also look forward to hearing from DOE on how it is prepared to protect our city students if the new proposed federal regulations take effect as written. I'd like to note another resolution that will also be heard today by the Committee on Education, Resolution 811 by Councilmember Miller, which I'm proud to be a prime co-sponsor of, calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to require inclusion of employee protection provisions, EPPs, in all current and future school bus contracts in New York City. The removal of EPPs from school busing contracts could create a deficiency in pension funds for current and retired workers due to a loss of contributions. Finally, I'd like to thank the Education Committee's outstanding staff, Malcolm Budahorn, uh, Jan Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Caitlin O'Hagan, and new uh, to, the, to the committee, uh, Chelsea Bedemore, our finance analyst. I want to also thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, and Vanessa Ogle, my policy director. I'd like to now uh, turn things back to Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Traeger. Uh, appreciate all those numbers. We're going to uh, hear now from the chair of the Committee on Higher Education, Inez Barron. Did I just say that? Mark, yeah. You said it right. Council Member Inez Barron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Inez Barron. I have the pleasure and distinction and honor responsibility of being the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. I'm also a member of the Education Committee, chaired by my esteemed colleague and co-chair of today's hearing, Councilmember Traeger of Brooklyn, and I want to thank Chairs Rosenthal and Traeger for their leadership in this very important topic, and on behalf of the Higher Education Committee, welcome everyone in attendance today. Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972 provides that no person shall, quote, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be the subject of discrimination under any ed education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, end quote. The City University of New York, of which I am a proud alum, Hunter College, class of January 1967, similarly recognizes through its legislative mission the vital importance of providing equal educational acti activities for both sexes as well as for all ethnic and racial groups. I applaud CUNY's efforts to meet these goals. A lot of attention has been paid to Title IX over the past few years, and much of that attention was focused on the extent to which our nation's colleges and universities have failed to institute processes and procedures to protect students, women, as well as transgender, non-binary individuals, and yes, men, from sexual harassment and sexual assault on campus. Now, the Trump administration's recently proposed changes to Title IX have gone in a vast chorus of criticism, specifically that the proposals do not expand protections on campus, but instead roll them back. This is particularly concerning when one notes national data, data from the very administration proposing these changes, that the number of sexual assaults on college campuses increased by 305% from 2,200 in the year 2001 to 8,900 in the year 2016. This begs us to ask why are these rollbacks necessary and why now? As I have acknowledged in prior hearings on sexual harassment and sexual assault, it is, a it is a difficult challenge to balance the rights of students and provide due process for both parties in a complaint. But racism and sexism are very apparent all around us, and sexual violence is a particular issue for black women and trans women of color. As CUNY highlights in its comments to the proposed changes, victimization data shows that 84% 
of sexual assault and rape victims are female, and 44% come from low-income families of color. Yet people of color are less likely to report their experiences to authorities for cultural, social, and legal reasons. And I would say also for historical reasons. We know the stereotype is that men per perpetrated sexual assault on women. But in her recent book, Stephanie Jones Rogers, who's an assistant professor at University of, of California, Berkeley, said, the title of her book is, They Were Her Property. And the subtitle is, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. And she dismantles the myth that white women were passive witnesses or reluctant partners to the economic policies of slavery. She has used primary sources to compile a list of the uh, instances of complicit upholding of everyday cruelties and the, the uh, variety of sa uh, that existed in racial slavery. She talks about how women enslavers skirted the limitations of gender norms and statutory law and ceded nothing in some instances to their husbands. And she talks about it in a way that is previously understated. She includes the forcing of black women and black men into unwarranted sexual relationships, such as Thomas Jefferson had with Sally Hemings, to bear children that would incre increase their numbers and their economic worth. And historically for black men, they have been the victims of sexual assault as perpetrated on them through genital mutilation and castration. We know that gender discrimination is not limited to any gender or to any race, and it exists in all combinations that we talk about. And I believe that we must consider our history as we look forward to make changes for our future. CUNY's diverse student body is 57% male and 76% students of color. 76% come from low-income families, and it is very concerning, concerning them that the additional burdens contemplated by changes to Title IX could disproportionately and negatively affect CUNY students from seeking the protections of Title IX and make it all the more difficult for victims to establish their cases. At today's hearing, I expect to learn more about the impact that the proposed changes will have both at CUNY and in our DOE schools. And I am particularly looking forward to learning about what we as a city and this council can do to make all of our students feel safe. And lastly, I want to commend all students, victims, and survivors who are here to testify and tell their stories so that we may learn from them. Thank you, and I'd like to recognize the members of my committee who are here. Uh, Council Member King is here. Council Member Rodriguez was here but did leave. And uh, Council Member Cummo is here at the end as well. And I would like to thank for putting for their work and putting to to get together today's hearing. Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, N. Indigo Washington, my CUNY liaison and director of legislation, Paul Sinegar, my counsel for the committee, Chloe Rivera, the committee's policy analyst, and Michelle Peregrin, the committee's financial analyst. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, I'm going to paraphrase the um, statement which will go into the record from Councilmember Adams, who is the sponsor of Resolution 797, where she talks also about the importance of uh, Title IX and um, the concerns of Department of Education having only one Title IX coordinator um, for the largest school district in the country. Um, and her hope that uh, the Department of Education will hire more Title IX coordinators with or without the resolution calling on them to do so. With that, I'm going to ask um, counsel to uh, read the oath, whatever you do. Um, I also want to say that 
uh, we're going to have to shorten um, testimony today because there are about 30 people who want to testify and I really want to hear from everyone. So if people could start to look at their statements and think about how you want to paraphrase and pull out the most important points, I would really appreciate that. Do I know some first? Oh, you're okay. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions at this hearing today? Thank you. I'd like to welcome Jackie Ebanks uh, from the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. Um, Ken Kenya, you will pronounce your name better than me. Um, from the Rand, who is the executive um, who really needs to work on his handwriting. But um, I welcome you, and I know you're from the Department of Education. Thank you so much for being here. Laura Brantley, who is the Executive Director of the Office of Equal Opportunity. Bridget Barber, Associate General Counsel at CUNY. And President Michelle Anderson from Brooklyn College. And I know I'm missing one sheet, but if people could introduce themselves, and again, my apologies for not uh, having all the witness slips, but can we hear from you first? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Barron, Rosenthal, and Traeger, and members of the Committee on oh, Education. I'm so sorry. I just have one more official duty. If I could thank uh, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Combo for joining us, and I saw Councilmember uh, Levine here for a quick second. And if I could piggyback on that, Councilmember Mizell was here. Oh, as well. yes. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you all for coming today. We're really looking forward to your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairs Barron, Rosenthal, and Traeger, and members of the Committees on Education, Higher Education, and Women and Gender Equity. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues impacting gender equity in New York City for all girls, women, transgender, and gender non-binary New Yorkers, regardless of their ability, age, ethnicity or race, faith, gender expression, immigrant status, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. The de Blasio administration has been steadfast in its commitment to promoting equity, excellence, and fairness for all New Yorkers. From combating workplace sexual harassment and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, to enshrining rights for pregnant and parenting New Yorkers, to ensuring access to inclusive services and paid safe leave for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, the administration has converted its words into action to become a leader in protecting the rights of all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background. It is within this dynamic context of change that the Commission on Gender Equity works to create a deep and lasting institutional commitment to tearing down equity barriers across New York City. CGE carries out its activities across three areas of focus within a human rights framework using an intersectional lens. These areas of focus are economic mobility and opportunity, where we have a goal to create a city in which all people of all gender identities and gender expressions live economically secure lives and have access to the opportunities to thrive. Our second area of focus is health and reproductive justice with a goal to foster a city free from gender and race-based health disparities. And our third area of focus is safety, with the goal of fostering a New York City free from gender and race-based violence. Each of these areas intersects with aspects of Title IX protections that are specific to gender discrimination. As you know, Title IX prohibits discrimination based on a person's gender expression or known or perceived gender identity. It also requires schools to offer students equal opportunities to play sports, 
and provide equitable gender discrimination of athletic scholarships. It protects students and staff from sexual harassment, prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy or having a child, and treats all students equally in science, technology, engineering, and math, and career and technical education programs. And finally, Title IX protects all persons who receive or provide services to an institution receiving Title IX funding, regardless of their sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, part or full-time status, disability, race, or national origin in all aspects of a uh, recipient's educational programs and activities. Therefore, in summary, Title IX applies nationwide to 16,500 local school districts, 7,000 post-secondary uh, institutions, charter schools, for-profit schools, libraries and museums, as well as vocational rehabilitation agencies and education agencies in the 50 states, the District of Columbia and U.S. territories and possessions. Accordingly, Title IX is a core policy that frames this administration's citywide efforts to achieving gender equity and inclusion. This, of course, includes our educational system. In response to the federal administration's changes to Title IX, the de Blasio administration submitted public co comments, recognizing that these changes, proposed changes, compromise Title IX implementation enforcement by revoking guidance on Title IX, which asserted that the federal law requires school to allow transgender students to use the pronouns, restrooms, and locker rooms that correspond to their gender identity. It also seeks to change Title IX, uh, the definition of sex, along a gender binary construct, either male or female, based on genitalia uh, at, at birth. This would eliminate federal recognition of the estimated 1.4 million Americans who identify as a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth. And finally, these changes propose a narrower definition of sexual harassment that could create a higher burden of evidence to prove harassment or assault, which would in turn create further barriers to survivors to access justice and would serve to discredit the courageous people that come forward with their experiences of sexual assault. Clearly, our administration opposes such changes, and we submit uh, the administration's full testimony as a part of the attachment to this testimony. So, in spite of these changes, these proposed compromises to Title IX, the de Blasio administration remains committed to advancing existing Title IX prohibitions against sex discrimination and ensuring access to educational opportunities regardless of gender identity or gender expression. CGE, the Commission on Gender Equity, carries out this commitment through its recently created Gender Equity Interagency Partnership and through its work with the Mayor's Sexual Health Education Task Force and its implementation of the global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence campaign. I'm going to go through each of these in, in, with some brevity. Through our recently created gender equity interagency partnership, which is currently made up of 57 city agencies, including those agencies who work to advance outcomes and safety for youth and young adults across the city, the Commission on Gender Equity continues its efforts to become the administration's center of learning on gender equity and the connective core which ensures cross-agency learning to promote gender equity in a streamlined and consistent manner. Also for the past year, CGE has worked with a multidisciplinary group of students, educators, parents, uh, sexual health educators, education experts, LGBTQ health experts, and the New York City Department of Education and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene leadership on the Mayor's Sexual Health Education Task Force. The task force developed recommendations that promote a comprehensive and culturally competent sexual health education for all New York City public schools and released its report in July 2018. 
our recommendations include incorporating a sexual health education curriculum with affirming and culturally competent information about personal safety, healthy relationships, sexual orientation, pregnancy, and gender identity. As a first step towards implementing the task force's recommendations, the Department of Education launched Health Ed Works to increase resources for schools to achieve many of the task force's recommendations, including creating school communities that prioritize health education, ensuring teachers are trained and supported to provide quality, inclusive health education, ensure, and ensuring that educators have instructional resources to provide said quality, inclusive health education. The Sexual Health Task Force, Education Task Force, will continue its work through 2022. And finally, through our safety focus area, CGE continues to partner with the Mayor's Office to end domestic and gender-based violence to expand the city's local implementation of the Global 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign. Through this campaign, we work with community members in various settings to ensure that we develop and promote community-based strategies to prevent, reduce, and eliminate gender-based violence. As part of this work, we're able to reach young people wherever they are, in schools, community-based nonprofits, faith-based institutions, and NYCHA housing developments. In 2018, this campaign reached over 12,000 New Yorkers in 35 community districts. Before closing, I would like to address the Council's proposed amendment to CGE's annual reporting requirement under Local Law 67. <coughs> This amendment would have CGE include information about the administration's Title IX compliance in its report. CGE welcomes additional conversations with the Council and relevant city agencies which currently track, collect, and monitor data that may inform such Title IX reporting across the city. In so doing, we'll ensure that CGE avoids duplication of current Title IX data collecting and reporting efforts and look forward to having further discussions on this uh, amendment. CGE remains dedicated to working in close partnership with our city agency colleagues <coughs> and communities throughout New York City to promote this administration's commitment to equity, excellence, and fairness and to protecting the safety of all New Yorkers including its student populations. Again, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I look forward to working with the City Council to address this issue further. Now, my colleagues from the New York City Department of Education will tell you about the ways they will continue to advance this administration's commitment to safe and supportive school and work environments that support gender inclusivity, and are free from sexual harassment and discrimination, regardless of the unacceptable step backwards in its Title IX enforcement that the federal government has proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Traeger, Barron, Rosenthal, and members of the Education, Higher Education, and Women and Gender Equity Committees here today. My name is Laura Brantley, and I am the Executive Director of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management. Joining me today is my colleague, Kenyatta Reed, who is the Executive Director of the Office of Safety and Youth Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Title IX and the City's commitment to ensure that all schools and workplaces are inclusive and supportive environments. Ensuring a safe and supportive school and work environment that supports gender inclusivity and is free of sexual harassment and discrimination is a key priority of this administration. DOE's mission is to foster school communities and workplaces that are diverse, inclusive, and equitable. Our goal in all that we do is to advance equity, and that extends beyond Title IX to all aspects of our work. We have made progress in important areas, including implementing our transgender and gender nonconforming student guidelines over five years ago, increasing access to girls' sports teams, and making investments in the critical areas like implicit bias training for staff and strengthening school climate. Our partnerships have been crucial in advancing this work. 
Thanks to this council's, thanks to the council's Young Women's Initiative, DOE has benefit, benefited from the appointment of our gender equity coordinator. All middle and high schools are equipped with feminine hygiene products, and we have been able to provide work-based learning and internship opportunities to young women as part of our focus on career and technical education. In addition, the Council's advocacy for creating an LGBTQ community liaison has advanced our commitment to making our schools inclusive, welcoming, and affirming for students of all gender identities, gender expressions, and sexual orientations. Although the federal government has proposed an unacceptable backwards in its Title IX enforcement, we at the DOE are committed to advancing equity. We plan on maintaining the broad protections set forth in our Chancellor's regulations, which exceed Title IX requirements, as well as innovative programs that value diversity, inclusion, and equity while promoting excellence. Creating equitable environments that are free from gender-based discrimination and, ha and harassment is the responsibility of the entire DOE. OEO and OSID are here to represent the agency today as the two divisions with oversight over this very important work. As the executive director of OEO, I directly oversee the DOE's gender equity policies and procedures. We deliver support to the DOE through coordinating mandatory sexual harassment training to every DOE employee, conforming with the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, and providing training to field-based employees to ensure compliance. Prevention and awareness training throughout the year for all members of the DOE community regarding the DOE's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy within Chancellor's Regulation AA30, as well as other federal, state, and city anti-discrimination laws. Ensuring students, parents, employees, applicants for employment, and others know how to file complaints of unlawful discrimination or harassment by DOE employees. Investigating and resolving allegations of discrimination, harassment, and sexual misconduct for students and staff pursuant to Chancellor's Regulation AA30. Analyses of recruitment and promotion data to identify areas for improvement. Providing oversight and guidance to faculty and staff in handling workplace accommodations. And partnership with several divisions to promote diversity, cultural sensitivity, inclusion, and equal opportunity for students and staff as outlined in the DOE's Respect for All policy. The DOE's Title IX coordinator is an integral part of OEO, reporting directly to me and responsible for oversight of the DOE's compliance with Title IX. This includes investigating staff on staff and staff on student complaints of gender discrimination and harassment, liaising with various divisions and offices to ensure schools and workplaces are inclusive and free of discrimination, while providing training, collecting and analyzing data, and serving as a resource for staff, students, and parents. Our Title IX coordinator is part of the DOE's systemic approach to ensuring that the DOE's pr procedures for resolving complaints are implemented and administered at all levels across the department. This work is a shared responsibility across every office and division. The Title IX coordinator's work is supported within OEO by a team of 16 full-time investigators, two trainers, four diversity attorneys, and a disability attorney. Most importantly, as my colleague Kenyatta Reed will detail shortly, there is a critical school-based component of our Title IX network. Each school has a designated sexual harassment prevention liaison who is trained to be a resource for the school in this area, to respond to allegations of sexual harassment, and to assist in putting crucial supports in place for our students, such as academic support and counseling. Over the past year and a half, OEO has conducted 243 in-person Title IX trainings for over 8,000 school-based and central staff. The Title IX coordinator and OEO staff members have organized workshops for the OSID-led Gender Sexuality Alliance Summit, which focused on the rights of LGBTQ students within their school communities. The Title IX coordinator also provided guidance on Chancellor's regulations and policies, 
including building inclusive school cultures for students and staff with an emphasis on gender equity and inclusion. Further, the Title IX coordinator is part of a cross-divisional team responsible for updating the transgender and gender non-conforming student guidelines. Title IX is an integral part of DOE's annual diversity and inclusion plan, which supports and reinforces the DOE commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We update this plan, which includes hiring practices each year. As part of the updating process, the Title IX coordinator meets with, the, with other Title IX coordinators across the metropolitan area to discuss best practices for strengthening this commitment. I would now like to turn it over to my colleague, Kenyatta Reed, who will further discuss our work to ensure that DOE provides a safe, inclusive, and welcoming environment. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Traeger, Barron, Rosenthal, and members of the Education, Higher Education, and Women and Gender Equity Committees. My name is Kenyatta Reed, and I am the Executive Director for the Office of Safety and Youth Development in the Division of School Climate and Wellness. <clears throat> Nearly a year ago, the Chancellor created a new streamlined support system for our schools. That included creating the Division of School Climate and Wellness, led by our Deputy Chancellor, LaShawn Robinson. The division brings together offices that were previously in different divisions in order to ensure that our work in schools is viewed through an equity lens with a focus on the well-being of our students. This work is critical to the success of our school communities, and we are investing $47 million annually to support schools with critical resources to strengthen culture and climate, $23 million in implicit bias and culturally responsive education, and $8 million annually in anti-bullying initiatives. Ensuring that our school communities are safe, nurturing, learning environments that are free from gender-based discrimination and harassment continues to be at the heart of our equity and excellence for all agenda. DOE policy, as set forth in Chancellor's Regulation A831, expressly prohibits student-on-student -student sexual harassment on and off school property and establishes procedures for reporting, investigating, and addressing complaints. Prohibited conduct includes unwelcome and uninvited conduct of a sexual nature, including conduct that is physical, verbal, written, or electronically transmitted. Students and staff are well aware of this expectation. At the start of each school year, the requirements must be discussed with students and staff, and all schools are required to have a, a sexual harassment liaison. These designees now attend a full day required training and are responsible for turnkeying that information to the school staff. In addition to the DOE non-discrimination policy, Every school is also required to prominently display a check and respect poster, which informs the school community on how to report allegations of sexual harassment and to, distri to, dist to distribute a brochure that provides an overview of the DOE policy and reporting procedures. Through our streamlined DOE structure, we are ensuring our schools are places where all students can thrive we have, a school, we have school climate managers in every borough office whose job is to monitor and support schools as they create welcoming environments for students. Additionally, thanks to the leadership of the Council in creating for gender, gender equity liaisons, the DOE created a position gender equity coordinator in December 2016. Our gender equity coordinator has been vital to promoting gender equity and inclusion for all our students with a focus on supporting our young ladies, transgender and gender expanded students. Housed within, within OSID, our gender equity coordinator has taken the lead on initiatives to prevent and better respond to student-to-student -to -student sexual harassment. 
Our gender equity coordinator has been crucial in building our relationships with community-based organizations, especially those with a focus on anti-violence work. The GEC provides established partnerships, included Day One NY, through which we have provided courses on dating violence to 519 school social workers. The GEC is currently working with STEPS to end family violence, another provider of dating violence services, to provide training, with, to, to provide training on working with youth who cause harm to our District 79 counselors. Further, our GEC has put together events like the 2018 Women's History Mini Museum and now annual Sexuality, Women, and Gender Instruction Equity Conference, which was developed in partnership with our LGBTQ community liaison and is designed for staff to learn about advancing equity for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations. To ensure our work to prevent sexual harassment and discrimination is inclusive of the LGBTQ community, OSID offers LGBTQ-specific professional development. Thanks to the Council's leadership, our LGBTQ community coordinator is in his third year. This work, as my colleague mentioned, is a shared responsibility. Gender inclusion is critical to all that we do including through curriculum and programming. I'd like to share some of the most important ways we see this commitment come to fruition across the DOE. As part of comprehensive health education, students learn about healthy and unhealthy relationships, what constitutes bullying and harassment, consent and boundaries, how to be an upstander, and how to get help for themselves and others. Our K-12 Health Education Scope and Sequence, which will be available to all schools this summer, includes topics of sexual harassment, and we are working with partners and educators to identify additional resources to support teachers in incorporating this important material into health classes. We have also trained approximately 3,000 staff members on various important topics, including dating violence and healthy relationships, student-to-student -student sexual harassment, and gender inclusivity. The DOE works in close partnership with the Human Resources Administration and the Mayor's Office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence to support the Teen Relationship Abuse Prevention Program, RAP, which provides a full-time social worker focused on relationship abuse prevention and intervention services to nearly 100 high schools. The city has also invested to expand this program in an age-appropriate way to over 100 middle schools throughout the city. Athletics are also key to student health and academic success, and the DOE has worked hard in the last few years to bring our female student athletes equitable access to after-school sports, including making it a priority to add over 400 new girls teams since 2012. These efforts have successfully expanded access for female students. 47% of all student athletes are now female, with the percentage of girls teams and boys teams nearing parity. Approximately 48% are boys. Additionally, PSAL has started initiatives like National Girls and Women's Sports Day to highlight our female scholar athletes. We are also making athletics more inclusive for all students by incorporating nationwide best practices for our transgender athletes. Changing our PSAL website to list the roster of a student in their chosen name regardless of their legal name and conducting transgender student focus groups. It is also the responsibility of all schools to ensure the rights of pregnant and parenting students are met. Pursuant to Chancellor's Regulation A740, parent and pregnant and parenting students have the right to remain in their schools and fully participate in educational programs and extracurricular activities. To support pregnant and parenting students, 
DOE's Living for the Young Family Through Education, also known as LIFE program, which has over 30 locations in all five boroughs, provides free early childhood education and family supports so students can stay on path to graduation. Last school year, over 650 children and students, parents, benefited from the LIFE program. As part of the Chancellor's priority to accelerate learning and instruction, we are committed to providing inclusive, rigorous instruction for every child in a safe, welcoming, and affirming environment. Through STEM investments, including Computer Science for All and CTE, our focus is on expanding students' access to new college and career possibilities, especially female, black, and Latinx students who are traditionally underrepresented in technical fields. Through Computer Science for All, there has been significant progress in closing the gender gap. The, num the number of young women in high school taking AP Computer Science has increased sixfold in just two years and 1,266 young women passed the exam, which represents a seven-fold increase. Lastly, advancing gender equity by increasing the participation of young women across our 301 CTE schools and programs is a top priority. Over the last three years, we have seen an increase in the total number of female students enrolled in CTE programs as well as an increase in their graduation rate. Since 2016, we are grateful to have been recipients of the City Council's Young Women's Initiative Funds to support work-based learning opportunities, including internships. These funds have allowed us to encourage greater participation of underrepresented student populations for targeted occupational fields, such as informational technology engineering and architecture, construction and automotive transportation. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We know that the Council shares our commitment to ensuring our school and work environments will enable all students and staff to thrive. We look forward to working with the City Council on this urgent and necessary work. With that, we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Good afternoon, members of the Higher Education Committee, the Education Committee, and the Women and Gender Equity Committee. I'm Michelle Anderson. I'm the president of Brooklyn College, and I'm very pleased to be here. Chairs Barron, Traeger, and Rosenthal, my remarks today will focus on CUNY's response to the Federal Department of Education's recently proposed regulations to implement Title IX. Because of my scholarly area of expertise, I drafted CUNY's response, along with a team of other attorneys across the university. And after careful analysis, we concluded that the regulations would make colleges less safe and less equal. In summary fashion, I'll just discuss four reasons here quickly. First, narrowing the definition of sexual harassment. The regulations define sexual harassment as unwanted conduct on the basis of sex that is severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. An example illustrates the problem with the requirement. This is a shift. It used to be an or, could be one or the other. Now it's an and. So I'll give an illustration to illustrate the problem with requiring both severity and pervasiveness. So this is a hypothetical. One day in a laboratory, a professor of chemistry whispers in a student's ear that he would like to have sex with her and uses profanity to describe what he would like to do. The student is alarmed and drops out of the class as, the res as a result. The behavior is severe, and it denies the student access to an equal education. But because it happened only once, it's not pervasive. Under the regulations, the student would have no claim under Title IX. Second problem requiring that the harassment occurs what's called within an educational program. The regulations would prohibit colleges from responding to sexual harassment that occurs outside an education program or activity. Because the vast majority of educational programs and activities happen on campus, the regulations essentially limit the coverage of Title IX to on-campus activity. The problem is that most sexual harassment and sexual assaults of college students happen off campus. The following example illustrates the problem. 
Imagine a male student goes to a private apartment of a classmate to study together for an upcoming math exam. At the apartment, the classmate plies the student with alcohol, and when the student becomes incapacitated, the classmate sexually assaults him. As a result of the experience, the student avoids the math class and earns a failing grade. Now, under the proposed regulations, because the incident was not within an educational program or activity, the student would have no claim under Title IX. Next, requiring actual knowledge. The regulations require a college to have what's called actual knowledge as opposed to knew or should have known, which was the prior um, standard under the Obama administration, of uh, uh, sexual harassment that's reported to either the Title IX coordinator, him or herself, or any official of the recipient who has the authority to institute corrective measures. This would discourage colleges, like Brooklyn College and like others across CUNY and across the country, from discovering, from, from assigning and training responsible employees who have a duty to report, which is a proven strategy for discovering sexual harassment. Under current CUNY policy and under Enough is Enough, the state law uh, that covers this area, responsible employees who must report evidence of sexual harassment to the Title IX coordinator include more than 50 uh, members of the administrative and academic uh, leadership and include all of their staff members as well. By contrast, under the proposed regulations, it's only two employees who would trigger, trigger Title IX obligations. The Title IX coordinator, him or herself, and the person who is the official of the recipient who has the responsibility to institute corrective measures. And that's the college president. Only those two people, if they don't know about it personally, then there's no Title IX claim. Let me give you an, an example. A student reports to, say for instance, a student reports to a physics professor that she's being sexually harassed by a biology professor. The student explains that she works in the biology professor's lab as an assistant and the harassment happens after hours. The physics professor then reports to the dean of the College of Sciences and the dean replies that no one else should know about the situation because the biology professor is too valuable and she's a star or he's a star at the school. Neither the dean nor the physics professor informs the Title IX coordinator, neither of them informs the college president, and the student drops her biology class as a result. Despite the fact that the dean silenced the complaint, under the proposed regulations, the student would have no claim under Title IX. Last thing I want to mention is mandating these expensive and formal grievance procedures uh, that uh, are very problematic. Now, some aspects of the grievance procedures are entirely appropriate to grant due process to students who are accused of sexual harassment or sexual assault. They're fair and they're essential to due process. Things like notice, equal opportunity to present written witnesses and evidence, and prompt time frames. But the procedures go much further. There are more than a hundred additional requirements imposed upon institutions of higher education in these formal grievance procedures. Myriad, minute requirements dictate college behavior overwhelmingly in ways that favor predominantly male students over predominantly female complainants. For example, the regulations require the colleges to provide both the complainant and the respondent with attorneys or advisors who function as attorneys for mandated live hearings. Now, colleges would either need to hire attorneys or hire advisors and then train them on how to be attorneys to have these formal live hearings. Most colleges do not have the financial resources to do so. The regulations also require that the decision maker in these formal live hearings explain the exclusion of evidence to the party's attorneys and advisors. This decision maker would have to be trained in the exclusionary rules of evidence. Um, and most colleges do not have the resources to hire either outside counsel or former judges to function as decision makers or to hire lay people and then train them in the rules of evidence uh, for exclusion. The regulations also require actual cross-examination of witnesses and parties in hearings. That process would intimidate witnesses, re-victimize complainants, and deter both from participating in investigations, perversely undermining the very search for truth that the regulations purport to advance. The regulations require an investigator then, and this is a really interesting one, often overlooked, to turn over evidence, all the evidence, to both parties no matter how inflammatory, prejudicial, or irrelevant that evidence is. And it would include prior sexual history of the parties or third parties that was collected during the investigation. 
Worse still, the uh, regulations require the colleges to deliver that evidence in digital format, which could be easily shared on social media and then traumatize those who are affected. Digital transmission of evidence in investigations is a tool of potential mischief and harassment. Now, the complexity and cost of the formal investigations can be contrasted with uh, the informal investigations, which have no requirements uh, uh, at all for due process. So uh, in, in, in a sense, the complexity and cost of the formal proceedings encourage colleges to uh, encourage complainants and respondents to agree to informal process, where neither due process nor, ba nor basic fairness are guaranteed. Overall, the regulations would decrease colleges' ability to protect students from sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. They would make colleges less safe uh, and uh, would increase inequality on campuses. Chair Barron, Traeger, and Rosenthal, and members of the committee, we at CUNY are deeply appreciate, we deeply appreciate your commitment to Title IX, and I'd like to turn it over to Bridget Barbero, who's the Associate General Counsel, to talk about CUNY's Title IX policies, followed by Rodney Pepe Souvenir, Title, University Title IX Director. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Bridget Barbera, and I'm an Associate General Counsel for the City University of New York. I want to thank you, Chair Barron, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Traeger, and members of the Higher Education, Women and Gender Equity, and Education Committees for this opportunity to discuss with you the important topic of sexual violence and harassment, which I will collectively dis uh, use the term sexual misconduct. While there has been a culture shift in the way that our society responds to sexual harassment and violence, there is still a great deal of work that must be done to change the culture on campuses and ensure that students are provided a safe environment where they can learn and grow free from sexual misconduct. CUNY over the years has taken many steps to strengthen our sexual misconduct prevention education programs and raise awareness about the options that victims have on CUNY campuses to report, to get the care and services they need. While we appreciate that a change in culture takes time, CUNY is committed in moving forward to facilitate a culture shift away from the forbearing silence that surrounds sexual misconduct complaints. In order to make this change, CUNY is constantly reassessing and reevaluating its policy on sexual misconduct, which is CUNY's comprehensive policy dealing with and addressing sexual harassment prevention and adjudication on campuses. We want to ensure that students and employees re receive the supportive measures so that their education and their careers are not derailed because of one act of sexual misconduct. CUNY's policy was revised in 2015 and again in 2018 in order to encourage complainants to report these instances of sexual misconduct, to increase transparency regarding the investigatory and disciplinary process, and enhance due process rights for all the parties involved. In order to empower and to encourage complainants to come forward to report these incidents, we've ensured that complainants have significant control over how the cases are handled. We've endeavored to sculpt our policy in a way that does not re-victimize those who have come forward and encourages those brave enough to report to do so. CUNY appreciates that there are many hurdles that complainants may face when making the decision to come forward to report sexual misconduct. It is not an easy one to make. So we are making sure this process is transparent and supportive. Complainants have the right to choose whether to report to law enforcement. CUNY will not report an incident of sexual violence unless the college has determined that there is a threat to the safety of the community. But complainants are given the ability to have control in this process, control that they deserve. Complainants who have reported incidents to the college also have the right to remain anonymous and not have their identities shared. And although we inform complainants that this choice may impede or hinder the college's ability to fully investigate and address the matter, we make sure that they have that option and that choice. CUNY wants to empower those affected by sexual violence to not only report, but to fully participate in this process, which we believe can be achieved in part by providing complainants with more control over their participation. CUNY has also strengthened due process rights for both complainants and respondents or those accused. As part of changing the culture of silence that once surrounded sexual violence, CUNY has increased transparency with respect to investigatory and disciplinary processes. Parties have the right to appeal interim measures if they feel something's unfair or unjust along the process. 
No contact orders are commonly used when there's a report of sexual misconduct to separate the parties involved. Parties have the right to appeal, to ask for a review. And these are rights we deserve, that both parties deserve during this process. As part of CUNY's commitment to being transparent and open with our community regarding the processes related to investigating and adjudicating these incidents, our policy has been widely disseminated. College websites, it's posted and given to all complainants when they come in to make a complaint. And in addition, we discuss it thoroughly during our trainings for both employees and students, which my colleague Rodney Pepe Souvenir will discuss. CUNY appreciates that educating our students and employees of vital importance in moving forward our goal of creating a community free from sexual violence. But our trainings must be our trainings. And to that end, CUNY has created CUNY-specific training programs at no additional cost to the university for both student and employees. CUNY SPARC, which is the Student Sexual and Interpersonal Violence Prevention and Response course, is mandated for all students. We've also created an employee training program, Employee Sexual Misconduct Prevention and Response Course, or eSPARC, that myself and my coll colleague, Rodney Pepe Souvenir, oversee, direct, and created the curriculum to make sure that it's for our students. The program provides training on topics such as what to do if a student or a subordinate employee reports they've been a victim of sexual misconduct, examples of what constitutes sexual harassment, and also which agencies, outside agencies, that students and employees should go to if they need more help. In addition to these general training, CUNY holds annual tabletop trainings for employees who are directly involved with the investigation or adjudicatory process. Members of every single campuses, every single one, public safety officers, student affairs employees, human resources, legal offices, come together in the same room at the same table for a hands-on training because it is vital, we believe, that employees who have direct involvement in the handling of these cases should be trained regarding trauma-informed investigatory techniques, cultural sensitivity as to why some people may be willing or unwilling to report, and to ensure that all the parties, each party's due process rights are protected. These employees are making significant decisions that affect our students' lives, and it is our duty to ensure that they are trained appropriately. Finally, CUNY has unfortunately learned that many students experience sexual misconduct in the form of dating or domestic violence. And in these cases, the perpetrator is not a CUNY community member. And while CUNY has no authority to take disciplinary action against that individual, we will do all we can to help our students. Dating and domestic violence can have huge impacts on a student's academic progress, which is why CUNY provides interim and supportive measures to all CUNY community members who are victims of sexual misconduct. CUNY's commitment to providing such services to parties affected by sexual violence has led us to strengthen and increase and deepen our relationships with several not-for-profit organizations and non-governmental agencies that focus on providing services and education to both our student and employee populations. Our, our University Title IX Director, Rodney Pepe Souvenir, has partnered with groups such as the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Violence and Sanctuary for Families, and we have used these fabulous organiza organizations to provide education and important services such as counseling and other vital services to our students and employees. CUNY understands and believes that there is much more to do on this issue and is committed to changing the culture on each of its campuses. One, sexual, one incident of sexual assault or violence is one too many. We are continuing and constantly reviewing our efforts. We solicit feedback to make improvements and adjustments to our programs. We thank you. We thank you for attention on this important and timely issue, and we look forward to working with you to address these problems. I'm going to turn it over now to University Title IX Director Rodney Pepe Souvenir. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairs Barron, Traeger, and Rosenthal, and members of the committee. My name is Rodney Pepe Souvenir, and I am the University Title IX Director. Thank you for the opportunity to share CUNY's many advances in campus Title IX awareness and its response to reports of sexual misconduct. I also look forward to learning from your comments and inquiries here today. 
At its core, CUNY's goal has been to offer all that enter onto its 25 campuses a positive learning experience while also having its graduates impact the world at large. Nowhere is that more evident than in the work CUNY has done with Title IX on its campuses. This is most reflective with CUNY's adoption of New York State's Enough is Enough legislation into its policy on sexual misconduct. The policy was crafted to ensure safety and sexual assault awareness on all CUNY campuses. While it is not required, CUNY created the position of the University Title IX Director. This position, located within the confines of the Central Office for Student Affairs, works directly with all campus first responders, i.e. the Title IX coordinators, Chief Student Affairs Officers, and Public Safety Officer. To ensure full compliance with city, state, federal laws, and CUNY's policy on sexual misconduct. This entails education and developing best practices for quick response to reports of sexual misconduct, both on and off the campus. The University Title IX Director also works with other campus stakeholders to ensure that they are aware of CUNY's practices and procedures when addressing reports of sexual misconduct. The University Title IX Director works with two major groups within CUNY to ensure that the first responders render their responsibilities effectively. This is managed through monthly meetings with the CUNY Title IX Working Group. The Central Office Working Group includes the head of the major CUNY offices who are responsible for responding to Title IX matters, that being the University Title IX Director, the Director of Public Safety, Human Resources, the Director of Student Advocacy, the Women's Center Liaison, the Stu Director of Student Conduct, and Attorneys. The working group works diligently to ensure that the response from all these campus units are uniform and effective in ensuring compliance. Many implementation and procedural decisions are discussed and decided by this group. The second group the University Title IX Director works closely with is the campus's Title IX coordinators. Every CUNY campus and the central office has designated a Title IX coordinator. The student and employees, the Title IX coordinator provides training to all campus groups, students and employees alike. The Title IX coordinator ensures compliance and provides guidance on various matters involving sexual misconduct. However, their primary responsibility is responding to reports of sexual misconduct or assault and conducting a swift and fair investigation. While not a prerequisite for the role, many CUNY Title IX coordinators are attorneys and come with extensive analytical and investigative skills. The Title IX coordinators meet monthly to discuss matters they are working on, including implementation of CUNY policy, introduction to external agencies they may want to invite to their campuses, and best practices and effective investigation methods. CUNY recognizes the importance of the Title IX coordinator and the role they play daily on campus. In this regard, Title IX coordinators are encouraged to attend the many professional development programs and trainings offered throughout the city, such as those offered by the various family justice centers, Columbia University, and the State University of New York. In addition, many of the Title IX coordinators participate in a monthly citywide Title IX coordinators meeting to exchange ideas with other New York City Title IX coordinators from both public and private higher education institutions. Each new Title IX coordinator must undergo a two-day Title IX orientation, which includes conducting an effective investigation conducted by the University Title IX director. Title IX coordinators play an active role on their campus, fostering an ongoing sexual misconduct awareness campaign. For example, the Title IX coordinator, in conjunction with other campus groups, offers programs during March for Women's History Month, in April for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and in October for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This year, as part of their Women's History Month celebration, for example, your college was on honored to have Tarana Burke, the founder of the Me Too movement, give a talk to students and employees. I now turn to the key areas CUNY has been committed to shoring up and keeping strong. They are education, training, and instrument supportive measures. 
As was discussed by my colleague, Ms. Barbera, all the students described under Enough is Enough are required to successfully complete the SPARC online course. However, for the students enrolled in a study abroad program, we have instituted a policy of providing live trainings. This ensures students understand that even away from the CUNY campus, their safety and security is of the utmost importance. And swift action will be taken if a report of sexual misconduct is made while they are away. While these live trainings is not, these live trainings is not mandatory, CUNY recognizes that for many students, this may be their first time away from home. And this live training is an excellent opportunity for the students to ask questions and better understand the CUNY policy and procedure. The added live training focuses on drinking, which is often the impetus for sexual misconduct and the failure to obtain consent. During the live training, CUNY's policies are not only reiterated, but the training provides assurances to the students that CUNY is available and ready to assist no matter what the circumstances or where in the world the student may be. This past summer, live trainings were conducted for over 600 CUNY students and their chaperones who were part of CUNY's service corps sent to Puerto Rico to assist with Puerto Rico's rebuilding efforts. Other CUNY students traveling internationally were given the added live training was the CUNY Black Mill Initiative students who went on a two-week trip to Ghana. Live trainings are given even to students traveling domestically, which includes students interning in various legislative offices in New York State and Washington, D.C., and student organizations going on short weekend trips, such as the University Student Senate, who in 2019 attended the New York State Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus, the CUNY Coalition for Student and Disabilities, and the student participating in the Model Senate program during SOMOS El Futuro conference in Albany. All of these students received live trainings. This year, CUNY made significant strides in ensuring access to CUNY Title IX information. This past summer, our resident student affairs IT advisor worked with CUNY's web services to enable students to access the CUNY Title IX webpage on their phones. In addition, in order to give students and staff added access to crucial Title IX information, CUNY CIS and the Communications Department work to link the Title IX webpage through the university's Blackboard page and CUNY First, areas that are often frequented by staff and students alike. Now as to training. As is required by Enough is Enough legislation, all Title IX coordinators and their designees must be trained annually to respond effectively to any reports of sexual misconduct. As referred to above, CUNY has designated the Title IX coordinators, chief student affairs officers, and the public safety officers as first responders to reports of sexual misconduct. Students and employees alike have 24-7 access to someone if the need arises to report a sexual assault. To that, excuse me, to that end, since 2016, CUNY conducts annual trainings of the above-mentioned groups. This year's tabletop training, which was discussed by Ms. Barbera, included a brief overview of the nationally recognized trauma-informed interviewing method known as Forensic Experiential Trauma Interview, FETI. FETI is currently used by the NYPD Special Victims Division, the New York State Police, and various law enforcement organizations around the country. In 2018, myself, Brooklyn College Campus Title IX Coordinator and a Brooklyn College Public Safety Officer participated in FETI training through the NYPD Special Victims Division. CUNY recognizes the benefit of conducting an investigation during using this method, particularly where the student reports an incident but due to trauma cannot recall important facts. The tabletop training participants were encouraged to take the FETI training when offered to enhance their investigation method. As indicated, CUNY not only relies on the first responders to be available to provide immediate assistance to students, but is also aware that students may bypass the Title IX coordinator and seek other employees that they engage with on a regular basis to report sexual misconduct. CUNY has designated certain employees and their offices that they work in as responsible employees. 
Some examples of CUNY's designated responsible employees are all the staff members in the Campus Student Affairs Office, athletic staff, and human resources personnel, just to name a few. As indicated by President Anderson in her remarks, the responsible employee is crucial for their ability to be available to a student in time of need. Their ability to know where to report and what they, with what they have learned is invaluable. The campus responsible employees identified in our policy on sexual misconduct and are discussed both in the SPARC online training and the employee eSPARC training. The responsible employees undergo training to ensure that they are aware of the important role they play in students and employee safety. Now to determine supportive measures. Once CUNY is aware of a report of sexual misconduct, several measures are taken to provide the students with what we call a map of safety. That is providing assurances to the student that CUNY is prepared to assist them with services to make the student as whole as possible. As is mandated in the Enough is Enough legislation, we provide all students, whether complainant or respondent, with interim supportive measures. This is facilitated through the collaboration between the Title IX coordinator and the Chief Student Affairs Office. To that end, in 2017, CUNY designated one to two individuals on every campus entitled the Support Services Liaison, SSL for short. An SSL is immediately assigned primarily to the complainant after a report is made to the Title IX coordinator. The SSL provides immediate and ongoing assistance to the complainant during the course of a case and even beyond. The services the SSL provides includes, but is not limited to, no contact orders, assistance with getting an order of protection, referrals to external agencies for needed support, reasonable accommodations, academic adjustments, and campus escorts. These individuals often work in the campus's women's centers or have some advanced social work degree, which helps during this sensitive time for a complainant. As we tell the students during our training, one report of sexual misconduct is too much. While we cannot stop sexual misconduct, CUNY is committed to work every day to develop a robust program aimed at the prevention of sexual assault and ensuring CUNY students are aware of our responsibility towards them. I hope I've provided you with a glimpse of the work that we're doing, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, I, it's, it can't go without saying that CUNY is obviously doing remarkable work uh, around protecting students. And I think I tweeted that you knocked it out of the ballpark, something like that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for giving deep explanation of of the work you're doing. Um, I have one quick question for um, uh, anyone on the DOE or CGE side. Did you uh, write a response to uh, and send in a response to uh, Education Secretary DeVos's? Yes, new and it was mentioned in my testimony that it is attached, that response is attached to the commission's testimony. So the commission? Been, no. Submitted New York testimony. City, the de, the de Blasio administration, uh, submitted a response which is reflective of both DOE and GBV feedback on the proposed changes, and that document was submitted okay. with the commission's testimony as an administrative voice. Got it. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Traeger to start the questioning. Yeah. I'm very sorry, but Please. I have another obligation that I need to go to. I don't know if, if it's appropriate for, if there are any questions for, for me before I go, but obviously. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I have to leave soon. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Hang on so one sorry. sec. No problem. Okay. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to make a very brief comment. I, I'm a proud Brooklyn College alum, mm -hmm. and your testimony has made me that much more proud. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, President Anderson. Thank I don't you. know if, if my uh, co-chair, Chair Barron, has any questions for CUNY, because my questions are tailored towards DOE. 
Uh, thank you. We weren't aware that you had some time constraints, but we do appreciate your coming and your testimony. And I want to thank my colleagues for deferring to allow you to uh, respond to those questions. I do have some questions. When, when you complete your, the response to the Cleary report and you indicate the number of incidents that occur on each of the campuses, do you indicate what the response has been or what the findings have been in each of those instances? Not obligated under the Clery Act. Yeah. So under the Clery Act. Could you talk into the mic? Oh, I'm so sorry. Under the Clery Act, we are, um, we are obligated to report the incidents that occurred, but the response rate is not actually part of that legislation, part of that statute, or the information that they acquire and post. Um, we have our own internal mechanisms of reviewing cases that come in, the uh, process and then the outcome. But Clary is just for really notifying the community when there has been an incident of sexual violence. And it doesn't really look at the after effects or the other um, steps that may have taken. So you say you have an internal mechanism that deals with that. What then happens with the findings for each of those types of uh, sexual misconduct? Sure, so our policy on sexual misconduct is comprehensive and we want to make sure that every student who has an instance of sexual misconduct or is a, um, has been victimized can go to one document. And in that policy on sexual misconduct, it also has the adjudication or the next steps. So the investigatory process, what happens when you go and first report? The notice of allegations that the parties get and all those investigatory steps are contained there. Then once the investigation is completed and that entire process is done, the policy then goes on to explain the adjudication process, which is another, uh, an, another step that we want to make sure everyone participates in and that is fair and transparent. And it goes through how a student goes through the disciplinary process and then also explains that if it's an employee that the student is making a complaint against, it goes to HR in that area. If an incident occurs, uh, do, you re do you record data on the number of incidents that occur, not just student to student, but faculty to faculty, faculty to student? Do you maintain that data? I'm actually going to turn it over to um, Ms. Pepe Souvenir because she's created an amazing access log right. for us. So we've created a log for data um, capture, and that includes that information. So whether the case involves student to student, student to faculty, faculty to faculty, or employee to employee, we capture all that data and we keep that information through our access log that was, create, that was created. And, and you did talk about the training that every student is required to take. Not every student. Within oh, enough not is, every student, why not? Well, we'll, we'll explain. But Within enough is enough, it designates certain students that they feel are vulnerable. Those are the incoming transfer students, heads of student organizations, student athletes, students traveling domestically and abroad, or students that are considered at risk, which the campus itself can designate a particular student body. Our goal eventually is to offer it to every single student, and any student can take the SPARC training. But at this point right now, we offer it to the designated students within the Enough is Enough so why wouldn't it be offered to every student? It I understand you just said that it's not required, but why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't every student on all of our campuses know that there's training that you can take that would help protect you or give you information that might protect you in certain kinds of situations or help you avoid certain kinds of situations that might lead to unwelcome uh, sexual contact? As I said before, the SPARC program is accessible to every student. But does every we student know that they can access it? It is something that's provided to the Title IX coordinator's office. If and, you wanted to. And that's one of our goals. Right. The mic. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm, I apologize. Yeah. That's one of our goals, is really getting the word out. And part of our education program is not just educating on what do these terms mean? But it's knowing what their rights are and where they can go for these resources. We would like every single student, every person, to take SPARC. We think it's invaluable information. And what our hope is, the more that we are able to get this information to the students, to organizations, the more they talk about it, it'll be part of the vernacular. It'll be, hey, did you take SPARC? You know, I, I mean, that's, that's my hope, as, as corny as that sounds that everybody knows it's out there and we want them all to take it. So I guess I don't want to be repetitive, but I just don't understand why, you, why it's not happening, that every student knows that there is this opportunity to take this training. 
even though they may not avail themselves of it, that every student knows. I, perhaps we can talk further. I don't want to prolong the time. I, I do have other questions, but I think that I'm going to defer to my colleagues. I do thank you for your testimony. That's a great point. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Keith. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Thank you. I look forward to following up with you thank later, you. but thank you so much for your time. Council Member Traeger. Thank you, uh, Chairs. Uh, so I'll tailor my questions to the DOE, and so uh, my first question, um, even though I think we might have a sense uh, of the answer, I would like to kind of hear it on the record. Um, how many full-time Title IX coordinators are currently uh, on DOE staff? Currently, the DOE has an acting Title IX coordinator who works underneath me, um, is my direct report, and she has the full um, support of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management. Um, the DOE is committed to fostering safe, inclusive, and equitable environments for students and staff. Under Title IX, students not only have a right to an education free from discrimination on the basis of sex, they also have a right to equitable access to all academic programs, activities, and athletics. To that end, the DOE has a, a robust Title IX network that is shared collectively amongst the agency. Mm. At the DOE, we view Title IX compliance not necessarily as a top-down requirement, but we view it from a student's lens. How do we support the student at the academic level? And to that end, we feel that it is important and imperative that students understand that, they, that the DOE has supportive measures in place for them, and which is why, with embedded in every school, we have sexual harassment pre prevention liaisons who, are, who, provide direct on support, who provide direct support to students at the school level, who also understand the culture of the school and who students very often are familiar with and more comfortable with. In addition, we have at the Borough Field Support Centers, we have um, school climate managers who act as an intermediary between the school level and the Title IX coordinators. Um, my colleague Kenyatta had alluded to in his, during his opening statement to some of the supportive measures that we have at the school level. Uh, for how long has the current Title IX coordinator uh, been in this position? She has been in this position, um, well, let me backtrack first so that you have a full understanding of our Title IX coordinator. She is the Diversity Management Unit Chief, and she has been with the DOE for a number of years. Her team also consists of attorneys as well as diversity specialists, and she's a subject matter expertise. She has subject matter expertise in this area. And uh, so do you know how long um, has this person held the title of the parent coordinator in the DOE? She has held the title of acting coordinator. Um, it will, we're approaching a year now. One year? Yes. Um, and how, how much staff does this, this coordinator have uh, that reports to her and that she's able to, to lead and to make sure that they conduct um, work and outreach and advocacy in terms of their responsibilities? Yes, so the, the Title IX coordinator, as I mentioned, is the Diversity Management Unit Chief, and she has uh, three attorneys who report to her and one diversity specialist. In addition, she has the full support of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management, which also employs 16 full-time investigators who also investigate allegations that implicate Title IX, and we also have a team of trainers who conduct trainings that also involve Title IX and our anti-discrimination policy. And, and I want to say that I, I appreciate everyone's uh, incredible, this is very important work that everyone here is conducting, but I just want to give context. Uh, it's my understanding, for example, that the city of Oakland, which has under 50,000 students, according to research here, has 86 coordinators. We are 1.1 million student system. We have, I believe you, just, you said one. Um, 
and again, I am not trying to diminish or discount the incredible work of the people of, your, of the collective office, but as you, as you noted, they have other important responsibilities other than Title IX implications. And Title IX is an issue that I think you would agree, that you would agree, based on your testimony, warrants very serious attention and very mandated follow-up attention. Um, and so we are obviously concerned about the serious inadequacy in the DOE in terms of these incredible, uh, very important roles. Um, question, to whom would a student report sexual harassment and or assault while the coordinator position was vacant? Because you mentioned this person held it within the past year. So was there a vacancy, was there a gap in that position? No, so. there's been no gap in services, in Title IX services to the DOE population. Mm -hmm. And just to talk about our, our students, um, as my colleague Laura mentioned that this is part of our chancellor's priorities to advance equity. And this is at the center of all decisions that we make, which is why we have trained over 1,200 school-based employees to be student-to-student um, -student sexual harassment liaisons. By the end of this year, we will have 1,581 that are fully trained in every school. Um, we believe that we far exceed the Title IX um, expectations. We want to make sure that the supports are at the school level, and then those supports are further um, enhanced by the Title IX coordinator by our 16 climate managers throughout the city, and also our um, gender equity coordinator within our Office of Safety and Youth Development that works as a part of our entire team. Um, we, we, as you have pointed out, feel like this is a major priority, and we understand that one person cannot do it. We in no way say that this is the job of one, but this is our collective responsibility and it lives in multiple offices and in every school and has to be a part of every decision that we make. Um, the training that, has, that those school-based sexual harassment liaisons do and have to undergo is a six-hour training and is their responsibility to then turnkey it to all staff members so that every staff member is that support system for our students. Right, but what I'm hearing is that many of these folks carry additional titles and responsibilities. Is that correct? Yes, it's our collective responsibility. So we collectively, like everybody has to take this role and responsibility on. Every year, the staff must be trained in A31, which governs student to student sexual harassment. The principal has to verify that that training has taken place by October 31st. Right. I, I would just say respectfully that, you know, we, we, we can go say a school has many teachers, but a school might have zero social workers. And the response shouldn't be, well, teachers are then technically social workers too. Technically, we're not licensed social workers. I, I think I, I, I would like to go maybe go back to school to be a licensed social worker because I value social workers. But you need folks who are licensed and credentialed and experienced who know what they're doing and not c carrying five to ten different titles and different responsibilities because I think it then really diminishes the true value and impact of that, this credibly important work. Um, other cities are taking bolder steps to have dedicated Title IX coordinators. New York City should be leading the way, not playing uh, catch up. Um, what part of the Title IX coordinators existing responsibilities is dedicated uh, specifically to the prevention of gender discrimination in schools. That is, how much staff time is dedicated to preventing students from experiencing uh, sexual harassment? So we, we invest a lot in prevention and intervention. We've invested millions of dollars in social emotional learning as well as restorative practices, all to teach the preventative skills that are necessary so our young people are know and aware um, of themselves socially and emotionally. In addition to that, we've invested millions of dollars in our health education and sex, sex education program, which touches on consent, welcome and unwelcome behavior, and also um, uh, relationship violence. So it is, it is our belief that there's a multi-pronged approach, first in prevention and intervention, 
support and follow up. Um, and and we, we believe that education is the key to that, which is why our health ed curriculum and social emotional learning spans from K to 12. I, I'll be a little bit more specific. Uh, how many preventative trainings has the current Title IX coordinator provided for staff and adult leaders, specifically with regard to the legal obligation to protect students from sexual harassment? Yes, and I can speak to that. So the Title IX coordinator conducts several types of trainings at the DOE. Um, one of the trainings is entitled Equal Employment Opportunity, which provides DOE staff members with a review of our chancellor's regulation and our non-discrimination policy and includes a discussion of Title IX topics such as sexual harassment, gender discrimination, and pregnancy accommodations. In the past year and a half, OEO has conducted 243 in-person training sessions for 8,000-plus 8, school-based and central staff. Another training that the uh, office conducts is equal opportunity for administrators, which provides directions to supervisors regarding their responsibilities under federal, state, and local laws, as well as Chancellor's Regulation AA30. In the past year and a half, OEO has conducted 52 administrator trainings covering 14,000 plus supervisors. In collaboration with the Office of School and Youth Development, I'm sorry, 1400. sorry, 1,400, 1,400 plus supervisors. In collaboration with OSIT, OEO offers trainings regarding the DOE's policies related to the New York State Dignity, Dignity for All Student Act, DASA. Partic where participants are educated about their reporting responsibilities and the circumstances under which off-school and on-premises behavior may be covered by the Chancellor's regulations. We also conduct Respect for All trainings based upon the DOE's Respect for All policy, which highlights Chancellor's Regulation AA31, which covers student-to-student -student sexual harassment, Chancellor's Regulation AA32, which covers student discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and or bullying, Chancellor's Regulation AA30, and the portions that directly address student-to-student, staff-to-student discrimination and sexual harassment, and OEO has conducted trainings for 607 staff members. OEO also um, oversaw the training rollout of the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City mandatory training, which was rolled out to the entire DOE staff. And we also conducted in-person trainings for staff members who were unable to take the computer module, and that was 700 plus staff members. Also, the Title IX coordinator has conducted um, trainings this, this past year to over 400 staff members. Right, so th this is an incredible person. Uh, <laughs> this is a magic person uh, because if I'm hearing the numbers correctly, you mentioned 243 in-person trainings, yes. 1,400 supervisor trainings, 700 staff trainings by one person over the course of the year? When I introduced the trainings, um, I did indicate that these were trainings that OEO offered, and this, the Title IX coordinator offered some of the trainings, not all. We do have a team of trainers that are dedicated to ensuring that staff are aware of their rights and responsibilities, and also the uh, Chancellor's Regulation AA30. So it is a team of trainers, and the Title IX coordinator is part of that team as well. And what distinguishes the training that the coordinator has versus the other trainers? Well, the training that the coordinator has would primarily deal with issues of gender and sexual orientation discrimination, however, um, our office is mandated to provide trainings to the entire DOE population, and so the Title IX coordinator is also well-versed on issues of diversity and can offer trainings that respond to uh, questions of general discrimination as well as discrimination that implicates Title IX. Because if you're saying that there's other additional trainers that they work with, I don't know why the DOE just can't make sure that we build capacity and hire additional coordinators. Uh, if there are folks already in the pipeline doing this type of work, why don't we just build capacity and hire more coordinators? Uh, because we're seeing the, the, the data uh, from the State Education Department, uh, the number of offenses, or number of reported offenses, because I think the, the full number might not be known, um, are, are, are on the rise. And I don't think 
you know, I, I really appreciate the, the incredible work this person, our coordinator, is doing, but this, this, is, this requires a lot more than just one dedicated Title IX coordinator. I have a, I, I also want to just, uh, it says here, according to a recent uh, newspaper article, um, there was a 2,000% increase uh, from 2016 to 20, uh, uh, 2016, uh, 17 school year, and how does the DOE account for the change and for the significant spike? Because what we have here, uh, just to read to you, the State Education uh, Department School Safety and Educational Climate Reporting, SSEC, contains incident data for schools and districts. In reviewing the 2017-2018 data, it was found that there were 6,437 instances of discrimination, harassment, and bullying, uh, 1,493 instances of cyberbullying, and 3,069 instances of other sex offenses which involve inappropriate sexual contact, including, but not limited to, touching another student on a part of the body that is generally regarded as private, which includes, but is not limited to, uh, the, the, the buttocks, breast, genitalia, removing another student's clothing to reveal underwear or private body parts, or brushing or rubbing against another person in a sexual manner. And 456 instances of forcible sex offenses, which involve forcible compulsion and completed or attempted sexual uh, intercourse, oral sexual conduct, anal sexual conduct, or aggravated sexual contact with or without a weapon uh, including, but not limited to, uh, penetration with the foreign object, rape, and sodomy. How does the DOE account for these very troubling figures? The DOE takes the safety and the well-being of every one of our children as the utmost priority. Every instance, every case, every single one of those are horrific incidents, and we take them extremely seriously. What our efforts have been around informing our young people of how to report so that we can support them. So anytime it has expanded, in our eyes, that, that lets us know those are young people that we can actually support. You alluded to the fact that these are reported ones. Unfortunately, for far too long, these have gone unreported. Our young people need to know that schools are places where you can come out and you can speak to us, you can let us know. Those are cases where we can actually help and support our young people. We have added, as I stated before, every school now has a check and respect poster up to let them know who to come to, who to talk to, how to reach out and say, I need support. Every school also, as you all know, have respect for all posters and also our LGBTQ posters as well, letting our young people know where to go and who to turn to. So hence, yes, the numbers do rise because now they know who to go to. In additionally, at the beginning of the year, every child has access to these cards, which says specifically, what do I do? What are my steps? And right here on this is a QR where you can go and make the report electronically. Our goal is to support our students and do that vigorously. In addition, the state has expanded their definition. So yes, the numbers have, have changed, but I don't wanna get into those specifics and say, well, what did the state decide and not decide? Because yes, they expanded the, the definition. Our focus is on supporting our young people, knowing one, that they can turn to us, that they can talk to us, and that we can support them appropriately. And then number two, how do we teach our young people the appropriate ways to conduct themselves so that this ends? I, I, I say this respectfully that what, what I've been reading are cases where students and their families did turn to the DOE, but the DOE many times turned a blind eye and showed deliberate indifference and mishandled many cases, which resulted in lawsuits and uh, unfortunately additional trauma where our young people have to relive the trauma all over, all over again. And at times where the victims were, had, were victimized all over again, in some cases, the students that were on the receiving end of assault, for whatever reason, they got suspended at times. So clearly, this training and these pamphlets and these posters are not making a cumulative impact. I'll tell you what's more impactful than posters and pamphlets and cards, more Title IX coordinators in our school system. Um, I 
just want to ask, can you provide the committee with the training schedule and curricula for these preventative trainings conducted by the Title IX coordinator, not by other folks, but by the Title IX coordinator? Is there a training schedule and curricula for these trainings? This, there is no set training schedule. Our office provides, oh, the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management provides trainings um, upon request and we offer trainings and we solicit and we advertise that we offer these trainings throughout the entire institution. How many requests were made this past year? At this time, I am unable to provide you with that information, but I would be happy to circle back to you with that information. Respectfully, this was a hearing on Title IX. I would have appreciated that information to be made available today. Um, we would like to know the training schedule, how many trainings, and the curricula for each training. Can you also describe the Title IX coordinator's uh, relationship with the NYPD? The Title IX coordinator does have external relationships, um, including with the NYPD, but that that relationship is not on a day-to-day -day basis, and usually um, any communication with the NYPD would be on a case-by-case -case basis or a case that warranted police intervention. Mm -hmm. or poli I'm sorry, or police action. Mm -hmm. um, so y you wouldn't have any data or numbers about any types of referrals or NYPD investigations that resulted from Title IX contact? We, we would have to get back to you with that type of data. Um, how, are, how are students made aware of the existence and the role of a Title IX coordinator? Our students are informed at the beginning of the year that they have a student-to-student -student sexual harassment liaison on site. They are trained in the Chancellor's Regulation A31, as I mentioned before. And we keep the posters. Each school has 10 posters posted throughout the building to inform them of who to go to if need be. And again, they also give in cards are made available to parents so they have them on site so that they can make any reports directly and electronically. And we ensure that every one of those are followed up within our chances regulations A31 and completed. An investigation is done and completed within 10 school days. And how are students made aware at the beginning of the school year again? By school-based personnel. Who, in, who, who is that personnel? So that would vary, um, that would vary by the school. Why does that vary? Why is there no uniform approach in making sure that staff and students are aware? Well, majority of the time it's gonna be your, your student to student sexual har harassment liaison, but I don't wanna tell you that that happens 100% of the time, but the majority of the time that's who it would be. Does this liaison have other responsibilities in their role in their school? Yes. Can you describe some of them? It would vary by school. So it's a full-time full employee at the school. I, I just, I, I, I'm just noticing a pattern. I mean, the old teacher in me is using a T-chart comparison right now with CUNY versus DOE. We heard a powerful, comprehensive, well-thought-out approach from CUNY that still needs, I'm sure, some works and some tweaking. I am not sensing that from the DOE. Um, you can't just bury these titles and responsibilities on top of people that have made 10 or other additional these are this, this is a serious issue. We can't just attach it like a, like a sticky note to one of their, to a clipboard. This is, this is serious stuff. And I, I am not seeing a comprehensive, well thought out approach. I, 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 I'm really not. Now also, currently the DOE website lists, um, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, currently the DOE website lists uh, Jeannie uh, Gallego, uh, who is also listed as the diversity unit chief, as we've heard, as the acting Title IX uh, coordinator. Uh, when will current Title IX coordinator information be posted conspicuously on the DOE website for students, parents, and educators to access? That information should already be available on the DOE's website. We're, we're, hearing from, <laughs> we're hearing from folks it is very 
difficult to navigate. And I'm, I'm not sure why after you say a year and a half, they're still in acting in front, of, in front of the position. Is there an explanation as to why? Yes, so the DOE does take seriously this work and we are looking for someone who is committed to Title IX work but also to the Chancellor's vision of equity and excellence for all. And although we've been actively recruiting, we have been unable to identify a candidate to take on these responsibilities. Um, our search has been far and wide, and we take this seriously enough that we are looking for a qualified candidate to fulfill this responsibility within the agency. How long has this been posted? The position, the job description uh, had been changed, and so the new position has been posted, the new job description has been posted for some months now. And why was the position changed? I, I'm not following. The position, the job description, and the responsibilities were changed, and in our estimation, we wanted to strengthen the role of the Title IX coordinator, and so we uh, revised the job description to do just that. I, 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 this is highly problematic, and I, and I would urge the DOE not only to just post this one position, but to expand, at least follow the council's role, uh, the council's uh, recommendations in our prelim budget response of having at least seven uh, coordinators across across the city. Um, there is money in the budget. I, I, I'm a member of the budget negotiation team, so is my colleague here, Chair Rosenthal. We know there's money in the budget. We can get this done. We should get this done. So I would urge the DOE to actually post another seven, eight, ten more, because we need a whole lot more here in, in, in New York City. Um, currently, what materials or no notices specifically highlighting protections under Title IX do students receive? Can you point to specific materials and notices they, they receive during the course of the year? They receive a brochure on our Chancellor's Regulation A31 at the beginning of the school year, in addition to an in-class training. What about students that come into school mid-year, or, or because there are students who arrive to this country all throughout the school year, how do they get this information? So we have these brochures in every school throughout the school year. So as, if we have a new admit to the school, that would be part of their new admit packet. Every school would offer some type of packet to your newly admitted students. And is this information uh, available in different languages? Yes, it's available in um, 10 languages. And do the parents or the family students, ha do they have to request it or this is offered immediately to them in different languages? It's available to them. I mean, if, if, we, if we know that they need it, I mean. Well, what we've learned in my other hearings, if folks don't know what their rights are, they're not gonna ask. If you know that they have a right to have the information translated, we sh the burden should be on the government to provide it to them immediately. Um, so I would ask you to revisit that and make sure that they immediately uh, are asked if they need any translation assistance. Or yes, I, I, I misunderstood. I, I yeah. was just saying we don't assume right. that somebody needs it translated. We would have to know that they need it translated. Um, currently, if a student is sexually assaulted at school, what coordination happens at the district level to assess school climate at the school where the assault took place? Can you clarify your question? Uh, I'll, I'll read it. If, a, if a student is sexually assaulted at school, what, types of, what, what type of coordination exists uh, or happens at the district level mm -hmm. beyond the school to assess school climate at the school where the assault took place? So that's where our 16 climate managers come into play. Our climate managers work out of the borough field offices um, in addition to the borough safety directors, they would work in tandem to assess the school and support them as needed. Um, if it is a crime, we would also be working in partnership with the NYPD just regarding the investigation, but the support would be done by the climate managers and the borough safety directors. And, and how many times have climate managers visited schools to respond to sex cases of sexual assault in the past, past school year? 
climate managers work within our schools every day. I would have to get back to you on the specific reason why they went to the schools, but their job is to support schools. They, okay. That's what they do every day. And, and what is the qualification to be a, a school climate manager? School climate managers have license in school, um, in school leadership. Many of them are former assistant principals, some principals, all of them are licensed pedagogues. Are there licensed clinical social workers that are also? Some of them are former social workers, just as our deputy chancellor is also a former social worker as well. Right, and, and, I, and I'm a fan of the deputy chancellor, yeah. but she, I wish we could have her in over 1,600 schools every day, <laughs> uh, but she's, she has one office that she has to report to here at Tweed, and she visits schools as well, which I, I do appreciate. But my point is, why don't we have more social workers who are licensed and skilled in providing the best trauma-informed approaches to students who are in need of services? Yeah, we share your commitment to supporting our students in trauma-informed care. Um, with that, we've increased the support and trainings that we've offered to all schools. Um, every school outside of one has a guidance counselor or social worker and we're working vigorously to ensure that at the beginning of the school year that that school has one. So that's something that I know a little bit, a little bit about. N not every school has a guidance counselor or social worker. Um, and just to note for the record, I've cited to you the increase in offenses committed against our students and our school communities. But as we speak, there is a hiring freeze on hiring social workers and counselors in schools. So. I really am asking the DOE to go back to the drawing board and not only post additional positions for Title IX coordinators, but with the freeze and hire social workers in our schools. We have a crisis facing our students. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm mindful of time, my colleagues, my last question, then I'll turn back to the chairs. Um, what reporting or data can you provide about the ways that students who have, been, who have experienced sexual harassment or gender discrimination uh, the past have been accommodated? If a student has an IEP, are trauma-informed supports added to their IEP? So I wouldn't have that specific data about individual student supports. You know, I, 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 I can't tell you like an individual student, especially as it pertains to an IEP or anything that involves FERPA. Right, I mean, I, I would imagine the DOE agrees that there's levels of trauma associated with these assaults and offenses, um, and we must address the social emotional needs of our students. We agree. If a student has an IEP, are trauma-informed supports added to that IEP to make sure that they are complied with? Supports are added, absolutely. I cannot speak to an individual child and tell you whether or not that was a part of their IEP. Yeah. Supports will be provided to a school. Respectfully, a if, if, if the support looks like someone from, from Tweed or from the borough support office who's not licensed to do critical work to say, I'm here for you, that's insufficient. We need licensed credential people doing this work. And we need a, a measurement accountability tool to make sure that the students and their families are aware of their rights and for us to check if they're doing their job, uh, which I see is missing right now. But I'm mindful of, of the time of this hearing and I'll turn it back to, to, to the chair. Thank you so much. I want to recognize Council Member Lander and Council Member Ayala was here. Um, I, I wanted to ask just real quickly and, and my colleague has a couple of more questions and then I'll come back. Uh, what? Um, so, so we, we did find the name of the Title IX coordinator on the DOE website, but when we look up that person on LinkedIn, uh, that person does not reference being a Title IX coordinator. And I, look, LinkedIn, my, my LinkedIn page isn't up to date, but I don't get the sense this person is embracing the totality of what a Title IX coordinator is supposed to do. Um, uh, it feels like this person has a lot of work to do and also Title IX. Was there somebody before the acting person 
or how long has the position been vacant? Yes, and so I will speak to that. Yes, there was someone who was present in that position before. Um, but how to your long point, were they present? She was in the role before I started within the unit, so I would say at least two years for sure. Um, I would have to get back to you with exact dates on her, with her, with regards to her dates of employment. However, to your point that the Title IX coordinator is not dedicated and immersed in this work, um, respectfully, I would, I would have to disagree with your assessment, um, primarily because um, I am very familiar with the work that our acting Title IX coordinator is involved in, and I can assure you that um, she takes the work of Title IX very seriously, as I indicated before, she is a, special, a diversity specialist. She has a background in, in works of equity and inclusion. And Title IX is not, a, is not a requirement in and of itself. It is also, it touches upon other aspects of diversity work as well, including equity, um, acts of discrimination, and so, the work is a whole, her work is a holistic approach that touches upon many aspects of the agency. And she not only um, liaisons with schools, but she also makes sure that DOE employees are educated on anti-discrimination policies, which includes sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination, which is implicated by Title IX. She trains employees on how to identify, stop, and prevent sexual harassment. She investigates Title IX related complaints of staff to staff as well as staff to student complaints of gender discrimination, gender-based harassment, sexual harassment, and or sexual violence. Um, as I indicated before, she liaises with various DOE divisions to ensure that agency environments are inclusive as well as, as, well as free of sexual harassment and gender slash sex discrimination. She seeks to ensure that information about Title IX, including procedures for filing a Title IX complaint, is easily accessible to all DOE staff. She monitors outcomes of sex discrimination complaints, identifies and addresses patterns of harassment through targeted training, collects and analyzes data on Title IX-related complaints and investigations, and keeps OEO leadership appraised of guidance from OCR, Department of Justice, and this New York State Education Department on areas impacting Title IX. Compliance. No, I know the job description. Please, um, you know. Let me tell you who I have confidence in. I have confidence in CUNY. Did you hear anything in their testimony that you might want to take back and adopt? for the Department of Education. They were quite detailed. Was there anything in there that you thought was interesting? Well, naturally, um, their testimony was very succinct and broad and addressed Title IX compliance on a, on a college level. Um, but our dedication is to students through K through 12, and I think that some of the tactics that might apply in a college setting may not be certainly applicable to a population um, Let me ask you this K question. Students. If I could ask CUNY, how many incidents uh, were reported last year under Title IX? We have records of all reports of- No, uh, no, no, I, I, I don't care about any individual. What was the number, the total number? I'd, I'd have- Of all the campuses? Of all the campuses. Yeah, we'd, have to, we'd have to provide you that number. But we have the number. But we do have the number. Is it 1,000? No. Oh, no. It was in your testimony. It was like, and, and, and by comparison, I'm going to ask DOE the exact same question. So you're this woman's boss. How many incidents uh, that would fall under Title IX were reported last year? For staff to staff, there was 147 complaints. And? And then for student to student complaints, we have 3,400 and over 3,400 complaints, allegations. Okay. So 
how many of the allegations that were made? I'm sorry, those were substantiated. I apologize. Okay. They were substantiated. Three thousand. Is that in your testimony? No, that's in the SSEC data report that uh, Chair Traeger also quoted as well. The same numbers. Okay, so of the over 3,000 that are substantiated, how many times was an NYPD officer called in? I would have to get those numbers from NYPD specifically. So not, it's not in your internal records whether or not someone reached out to NYPD? We do have those on our internal records. We'd have to cross-reference them also with NYPD to see if I, this is too difficult. The, the, I think I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to turn it over to the next person to question, so I uh, am civil. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal and uh, Chairs Barron and Traeger. There's a lot of ground that's been explored here, and obviously the uh, critical work to be doing to make sure that we significantly expand our capacity to make sure that uh, gender inclusion and Title IX are being enforced. Um, I, I want to ask about a very particular, there's a lot of different issues here, and we could go on in many, many different areas. I'm going to drill down on one very specific one, um, and it does happen to be one where uh, my daughter uh, got involved in some of her young activism, but also an area that I read in the Girls for Gender Equity is a real area of concern around diversity and gender equity. And I want to ask about um, uh, the issue of having a citywide dress code uh, and school dress code violations. Um, and I haven't been here for the whole time, so if this has already been asked and answered, I'll defer, but I, I don't think so yet. Um, so it's my understanding that there is not a, a citywide dress code that tries to set a reasonable but inclusive standard um, mindful of issues of gender diversity for, you know, transgender, gender nonconforming, and cisgender New York City K-12 students. Is that correct? So our chances of regulations clearly prohibit schools from having gender-based dress codes. Ask, is there a city, can you answer my question rather than your different questions that I didn't ask? Is there a citywide dress code that sets a reasonable but inclusive standard? So we do not have a citywide dress code. Those okay. are done on a school level. Schools However, are allowed to have their own individual dress codes. Yes, our regulations well, prohibit It's the them. law that they couldn't be gender discriminatory, so it's not that impressive that correct. DOE says you can have a dress code, but it's not allowed to be gender discriminatory. It would violate city, state, and federal laws if they had gender discriminat overtly gender discriminatory dress codes. So do you, is there someone that reviews the dress codes from all the schools to make sure that they comply with that standard? Once we're notified, then we should, we... Can you, t I'm, I really don't want to be rude, but like, is there someone who reviews all the dress codes of all the schools, since you don't have one citywide standard, to make sure, given that they quite often relate differently to boys and girls' clothing, to make sure that they aren't discriminatory? So to answer that, once we are made aware, then we work with the school and the superintendent to ensure that it's non-discriminatory. Once you're aware they have a dress code or once someone complains that it's discriminatory? Once we are aware that they have a, d a dress code that is in violation of our chances regulation. You investigate after code. you're already aware they're in violation? Sir. I'm going to ask the question again because I was a really easy yes or no question. If a school, does, are schools required to have dress codes? No, they're not. Okay, if they have one, are they required to give it to DOE? No, they're not. Okay, so they could have them without ever giving them to you? Yes. Okay, so it's definitely not the case that if a school has a dress code, someone at DOE reviews it to make sure that it is not discriminatory, because you might not even have it. That's correct. Okay. Um, do you think that's a good policy? What policy are you referring to? Well, the, this kind of don't ask, don't tell non-policy of dress codes that you have. I, I don't know what you're necessarily asking me. I'm not sure. 
Well, you do, okay, I, I'm, I'll spell it out then. I mean, I, I've heard many incidents from different schools, and it happens to be that one of them is the middle school that my daughter went to because there was a very, like, a big protest around it. But I've heard it especially from schools that have predominantly young women of color that there are incidents where uh, these dress codes that schools are allowed to develop without guidance or standards from DOE um, are then enacted and enforced that ways that make girls feel shamed, that are imposed in discriminatory ways, that lead to disparate enforcement where girls especially wind up being called to the principal's office or the AP's office or told to go home and put a sweater on or get disciplined in other ways um, with very little oversight or any attention from Tweed or DOE in any way. So I guess I'll ask this other question. Uh, you know, you say that after someone alleges a violation, then you review the dress code. Uh, how many times has DOE had it, you know, last year or in whatever way you keep the data, was it, did you receive such complaints about discriminatory dress codes and, and how many young women, if you're aware, or men too, or, or transgender or gender nonconforming students, experienced some form of discipline or being sent home or other form of consequence as a result of a school dress code? So students cannot be suspended or removed from class for not complying with a school dress code. And as far as... So, so they none were or they're not supposed to be? They cannot be. Well, I know they are. So, I mean, it might be against the rules, but you're saying no one has ever complained of that. I'm, I'm telling you they are not allowed to do such. If we are informed of that, then that is reported to the Office of Special Investigations, which would investigate the school practices. And then the school-based personnel, such as the principal, would then face disciplinary and, measures. And how many times do you have records of, com of such complaints? I do not have those records, but we'd be happy to get back to you with that. Okay. So, okay. You, you, I would appreciate if you would get back to me with that. Correct. Um, because, I, I mean, I've heard reports of, you know, and again, I, you know, I trust my daughter as a reporter in this case, but there's also a whole report that Girls, Girls for Gender Equity did about young women who have experienced this. So we know it's happening, even though it, you said it cannot happen. Sir, I, I completely share your commitment to this, and I'm not in any way saying that this is not an issue for us. We share that commitment. And I am saying to you, the more we know, the more we can support all of our young people. You inform us, parents inform us, which is why we give parents and children direct access to us, so that we can ensure that our policies are followed out as we've designed them. Well, would, so this will be, and then I'll end my question, because wouldn't it be easier if we had a policy? So each school has its own culture. Does each school have its own curriculum standards? Sir, each school has its own culture that they have to adopt. And every school has the ability to, uh, to use different textbooks, to, to use different resources, that is the individual school's rights and responsibilities to do such. I was a principal of a school, we had a dress code. I was also a principal of a school that did not have it. It was each individual you, school had And that your policy couldn't offer several options? Like I am not saying that all provide. students should wear the same clothes on all school days, but you could easily have a policy that says, here's the range of policies that you may have. If you're going to set a standard, here's what it can and can't do. There are, there are a lot of nuances here, and you know that principals get into trouble by starting to put into their policies what covers a midriff or what covers a shoulder or a yeah. whole set of issues that are absolutely going to trip people up into problems here and having some guidance and clarity from the DOE about what a responsible, inclusive citywide dress code was with the range of things that it allowed seems like it would be a lot easier way to set a standard to make sure that it is compliant with Title IX and gender uh, diversity and inclusion issues. So I'll stop here. It seems to me pretty straightforward. Which it would be a lot easier if you would develop a citywide dress which code. Is what, which is uh, what I said. We have a very clear standard that prevents. You don't have a very clear standard. It, it clearly prevents. It clearly does not prevent. You have a standard that says you're not allowed to, but Correct. you know it's happening and you provide no guidance on how to help people tell what would from what wouldn't. 
if, if, let's just say if I were a principal, I, I, I really I don't want to, if I, if, let's say that I were a principal who wanted guidance, well, all right, I'm going to stop here. I, there's a, it's a long hearing. There's a lot of issues. It would be a lot easier to develop a citywide inclusive dress code that gave a range of options to schools and let principals do from amongst a range of options or some standards, some clear guidance, and not simply it's against the law to discriminate, Good luck with the rest. So uh, I'll leave it there. It really wouldn't be that hard. You wouldn't even have to hire eight more uh, or nine more Title IX coordinators. I bet that the one person who's there with good guidance and information from colleagues could do, could do that on their own. So thank you. Thank you. You know, another, just following up on your point, um, what does a gender nonconforming student do when there's a dress code at a school? You're not allowed to have gender-based dress codes, you know. So, it is it, it is prohibited so, by a chancellor's regulation to have. So any dress, dress code, code that a school has that says boys may wear X, girls may wear Y, that, is that a is, violation of your rules. That is prohibited. That's every exactly, single one. That's exactly what I'm saying to you. Yes. How you think there's compliance with that rule? That is our rule. Do you think there's that's compliance with it? Broad, do you think there's broad com compliance with that policy? I believe the majority of our schools are, are compliant with that. If I could just jump in, I, I think, you know, I don't want to go down the path of it's a big, you know, there are 1.1 million students, it's a lot, and, and so we know that it's good for most of them. You know, if it's a big school system and if there are a lot of schools and a lot of principals, that's why you might need more Title IX coordinators, for example, right? I mean, everyone's doing their job. Let me ask you this, yes or no, do you think you need more Title IX coordinators after w the discussion today? We take, I mean, honestly, this work is extremely essential to us whether it's in the form of a student-to-student -student sexual harassment liaison that's on the ground with our students, it's with our climate managers, our 16 climate managers that work throughout the school, it's with our gender equity coordinator that works within our office, and it is also with our Title IX coordinator that works within Laura's office as well. Additional personnel to support our students, we, we welcome that, just as we welcome more social workers, guidance counselors, as part of our work. This is not easy work. We know that. Supporting a million students in 1,800 schools, absolutely. We believe the best resources are in the schools. The best training are for our school-based people so that they can support our students appropriately. Do we have a ways to go? Yes, and we're committed to walk that road. Yeah. I just want to ask a question that I, 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 I hope, does the DOE's hiring freeze apply to the Title IX coordinator position? As, Please as, tell me no. Hmm? Let me couch your question. We were in a meeting with the mayor the other day and it's our understanding that the LGBT uh, coordinator, it's, I'm not sure of his title, that position in particular uh, is not, is, is uh, waived from the hiring freeze. So for the Title IX coordinators, what, what's the thought there? Yeah, but they, it's not subject to the freeze. Okay. I've been advised by my colleague that the Title IX coordinator positions are not subject to the freeze, to the hiring freeze. Okay, there's one. It's not multiple, but okay. Um, so, so you've gotten no applications for the last year and a half to fill the position? No, that is not accurate. We've been actively interviewing, and to date we have not been able to secure a qualified candidate for the position. All right, so I'm just putting it out there to the general public. Uh, Department of Education is looking for a Title IX coordinator. So far, they've not found anyone who is qualified to do the job. I would urge people to apply. How do they apply on your website? When you go to our website, you would go to the section that's noted as careers, and you can find it that way. 
Okay, I know and that. Chair, and, yeah. and they could certainly notify the numerous climate specialists, climate folks that they have to also apply. That could be a pipeline. Thank you for your suggestions. Um, Council Member Barron, I know you had two more questions. Yes, uh, for the Department of Education and for the uh, commission, uh, CUNY talked about the fiscal impact that would come about if they had to change and implement the new proposed rules for Title IX. Have you done any assessment to determine if there would be any fiscal impact on the rules if they were implemented as, a present, as they are proposed? Would there be a fiscal impact for DOE as well? That assessment has not yet been done. I think what we've tried to show today is that we have a systemic commitment to this issue and we have embedded this work throughout every aspect of the school and the central administration. Okay. There's always more to go, but that assessment regarding uh, financial impact has not yet been done. Thank you. And do you have the number, you talked about the number of student-to-student -student incidents, the number of staff-to-staff. Uh, -staff. Do you have the number of staff-to-student incidents? I asked this question before. That's why I'm asking it again in a previous, yeah. in, a pre yeah, in a previous hearing. Um, we would be happy, Councilwoman, to provide that data to you. We do not have it today, okay. um, but we can certainly, and will certainly follow up with you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and the, the other question I have in that regard is, what's the average length of time that it takes to get a resolution to these complaints when they are brought to the DOE? So if you could, if you don't have that, you could get that to me. So Chancellor's Regulations 831 governs how we support our students through students to student sexual harassment. Um, the I'm particularly uh, talking about staff to student. Does that have a timeline as well? You reference student to student. Right, okay. Yes, Chancellor's Regulation, embedded it within Chancellor's Regulation 830, um, the timeline for staff to student investigations mm -hmm. is 90 days, the 90. 90 day timeline. Okay, good, thank you. And for CUNY, uh, can you please get me the information disaggregated by um, gender, race, disability, and or LGBTQ status in terms of the number of incidents that are recorded at CUNY? Absolutely, yes, yes we can. Okay, and can the public asset access any of this information? in terms of uh, complaints that were investigated? Is there any public access for that information? Um, do um, uh, the published on the uh, State Education Department website is the aggregate data from each institution for the number of complaints, um, okay. whether or not discipline was referred, whether or not they sought law enforcement, um, and then I believe it has other categories such as outcome. So that is actually posted for, um, on the State Education website. Okay, Everyone great. can go to. And thank you for your presentation. I did appreciate the information that you did present. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to ask a quick few questions. I think we were all thrown by uh, some of the things that were said here today, but coming back to the legislation at hand, um, uh, do you have any comments about uh, the reporting bill, any suggestions you'd like to make? Um, and I think what I heard from DOE is that additional staff is always welcome as an answer to the resolution request. Right, um, I think regarding the reporting bill, what we, as I said in my testimony, we're, we're certainly willing to have uh, discussions with council around this. Transparency, of course, is of critical importance to us on all issues of how this administration interacts with the general public. Uh, we do believe that Title IX, as we stated in testimony, is not only an educational issue, but it's something that cross cuts the city at large and the work that the city does. So what I would want to make sure is that this additional reporting is not duplicative of existing sure. efforts, right? Sure. So I think along those lines, that's where I would say the discussion is, is needed. 
and then to be able to be very clear about actually what the Commission on Gender Equity would be accountable and responsible for. And to that larger question, do you uh, currently um, monitor incidents of gender and sex discrimination? That's responsibility of DCAS for the city agencies, uh, okay. e the equal employment function all rolls up. Each agency has it and then it all rolls up in data that's provided through the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Yeah. And do you see that as well? Does that go Oh yeah, well we see it, it's available and we access it as, as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you do any work? Uh, do you engage at all with DOE on Title IX? Our engagement, I think, would come through the Mayor's Sexual Health Education Task Force. Right. And so, as you know, we've been working um, in my capacity as Executive Director of the Commission. I chair that task force, and we've been working very well with DOE uh, as they are vice chairs on that task force as well. Um, let's see. Do you think that in that work, mm -hmm. um, how are uh, do you believe that the issues of gender and sex discrimination and sexual harassment and assault um, are taught in an affirming and age-appropriate way? I would say that the effort is underway and more needs to be done and that is recognized and accepted by the Department of Education. And I think that's also reflected in the Health Ed Works initiative that, that was launched. And so we do believe we have full partnership and the beauty of the Mayor's Se he Sexual Health Education Task Force is that it's a cross-disciplinary group, Great. right? So we have many voices at the table, student, parents, uh, teachers, and uh, various experts in the field. Do you believe that the current education includes information on students' rights in, si in situations and how they're supposed to report incidents? Yes. And I think it was uh, t uh, the testimony here provided to that. Yes, it does. How will the work of the task force be impacted if the proposed Title IX changes are implemented? The task force by Local Law 90 exists through 2022. We see our role as ensuring that New York City's commitment to gender equity, gender diversity, to respecting all individuals regardless of gender identity and gender expression remains the way that New York City does business. And I so really I think what it means for us is that we will indeed redouble our efforts to protect and ensure that our young people are kept safe in their school and settings. Thank you. What's the relationship between CGE and DOE's gender equity liaison? It is an ongoing relationship as a part of our broader gender equity interagency partnership. I want to also state that uh, DOE was one of the five initial gender equity liaison agencies, and the gender equity interagency partnership, which is now citywide, is a direct result of us working with only five agencies to say we've got to broaden this. So there is, uh, you know, clearly a center of learning established, and then the transfer of knowledge, which is about how do we expand this across all city agencies. So we've learned a lot being in partnership with DOE Gel. And it's very impressive, the monthly meetings that you're having. Do you well, believe- We're not yet having monthly meetings. Oh, I want to correct that. Um, but but um, we, we're ramping up to that. Um, do you believe that the DOE gender equity liaison uh, can spread her wings to fully implement all of the goals that CGE would want to see? What we learned through the partnership with the Gender Equity Liaison is that this is not a one-person solution. Hence, we have broadened it to a citywide intervention. Yeah. But I also want to talk about replicating what DOE is doing, that this has to be a culture shift. And this is so important that you, you're not only talking about having a staff person appointed to a position, but you're ensuring that an entire culture and climate changes. And so that's really what we're looking at. It's not either or, it's both and. And, so and during your tenure and with the new gels at, uh, and specifically at DOE, 
do you know of any examples that she has come back with um, of a support or accommodation for victims or survivors that she's talked about? I, I think one of the things she's talked about is how she strengthens her role vis-a-vis -vis sexual, sexual health education training and gender discrimination training. And that's what uh, you know, she has shared with me in the past and uh, sort of deepening her presence and her intervention around those. So let me ask issue. more broadly, mm -hmm. um, given your expertise, which I know to be true, um, have you learned about anything the DOE has done where they had a situation um, where they um, provided an accommodation for a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault? A specific case. No. I certainly don't want to hear about no, anything no. specific, but has, has DOE ever come to you and said, what would your guidance be here? No, uh, part of it is, is that there is this holistic approach. Um, okay, okay, yeah. sorry, do you, can you give an example? So our gender equity coordinator works closely with, our, uh, with multiple CBOs that are uh, support domestic violence provided um, survivors, I apologize, such as like the RAP program, the mayor's office to end domestic violence. Um, it, it, it is not a one person job, it's part of a partnership with multiple organizations, some of which like RAP are directly in schools. And as I mentioned, you know, the RAP program is currently working with 100 high schools and about to expand. Right, I guess my question is this, as you mentioned over 3,000 cases, uh, verified cases, can you give me an example of one situation? I'm not asking about the person, the year, the gender, anything, but just what was the accommodation that you came up with or the additional support? Right, so that could be additional support through our, through our partnership with RAP, we also have a very strong partnership with the Family Assistance Program. So you can't think of one um, thing in your mind, maybe over the last year, where there was a situation and the Title IX coordinator knew about it and um, suggested to make sure, not that another professional take care of it, but I mean, I wanna know that person is in the weeds. So what was the exact, was that person moved into a different classroom? I don't know what the supports are. Were they given access to therapy sessions every day? What, what, what's the DOE doing there? So that, that's exactly what I'm saying. They would coordinate to ensure the appropriate supports are provided. It would be additional support, such as at home, counseling. It could be counseling in the school. Do you it know whether be. or not that happens? Yes, it does happen. From internal, in, how do you know if that recommendation is given, how do you know that the student follows up with that? That's through our gender equity coordinator coordinating with the community-based organization that they've been referred to or the on-site counselor that is at the school. We also have at-risk counselors that will be pushed into schools. Um, when there Would is you a crisis know of a situation place? when it wasn't working for a student? In other words, besides complaint driven, do you have any tracking of what happens after a case is substantiated internally? Besides saying we're going to refer it to here, here, or here. Well, that's okay. I, I was just curious. I mean, and I would actually argue it goes along with the dress code. Is it, it would be so interesting to hear that. The dress codes, if, if a principal, because of their school culture, needs one, that it actually was sent to the, I, I would say, Title IX coordinator for review. Would that be something you'd be interested in? Right. We understand that a, a survivor of domestic violence is not something that we're going to look back in two months and say, okay, we have a data point check. It's an ongoing support that has to be provided. And the data regarding like an immediate turnaround, I, I don't know if that, that's what you're asking for, but we do ensure that, that our young people are getting the support needed, that they are seeing the counselors that they've been referred to, whether it be in-house or, out, or outside of the school. Like, as I said, we provide additional services 
where they will come into the school or potentially be referred out. And we do track and ensure that there's follow-up. Would you consider looking at the dress codes of individual schools to make sure they comply? Absolutely, you bring them to our attention and we will follow up. So it's a complaint-driven system. You wouldn't ask a prin principals to submit them to you? You're only gonna deal with a complaint-driven system? We'll look at that. Okay. Um, uh, Executive Director Ebanks, under the authority granted to CGE under Section 20-B of the New York City Charter, CGE may request information from any city agency or office it deems necessary to enable the Commission to properly carry out its functions. Um, when you're compiling your annual report, what data do you collect from other agencies? And is there anything in particular that just goes to you and isn't otherwise reported? There's nothing at this point that comes directly to us. Um, the commission has been um, us building its capacity to do that work and to require the data. At this point, we, we don't do it, but again, with the formation of the Gender Equity Interagency Partnership Group, we're beginning to lay the foundation to, to have that reporting happen. So with um, intro 1536, if that were to go forward, would that affect uh, your data collection capacity? Having it in law would be certainly an asset to, to the process. And, okay. And, um, okay. And are there other types of data that should be considered as part of Title IX reporting for Intro 1536 from a gender-based perspective? And we can talk about this offline, yeah, but if yeah, you have other I do ideas. Think that we'd, you know, would like to be able to follow up. Okay. Um, do you anticipate that the CGE 2019 annual report will be available in December? Yes, it will be available in December. I think the date was December 1st. Our, our, we have a simple challenge that as we launch our 16 year. days of activism against gender-based violence, it runs through December 10th, and we really like to have a full January through December 12-month reporting, but that doesn't have to be the case. I think that's a key way in which we I'm align with Title IX in sort of um, the, the public education aspect of um, ensuring that we have community solutions to gender-based violence. I'm very open to changing the date of that report. If that would be helpful, we can do that probably through this legislation. Yes. I'm guessing, Great. but okay. no problem. Um, okay, uh, lastly, does, um, I'm, I'm actually going to end it here. We have so many other people waiting to testify, um, but we've certainly learned a lot today about the work that um, CUNY is doing and the work DOE is doing. I heard some amazing ideas um, in terms of the roadmaps that CUNY is laying out for people. I think there's a lot to learn. It might be interesting to go back and meet with them. Is that something you'd be interested in doing? Yes. Okay, Definitely. great. Thank you all so much. I'm going to call up the next panel. Brittany, uh, these, this is from Girls for Gender Equity. Brittany Brathwaite, Bernice Duraccio, Umu Kaba, Andrea Gonzalez, and then also Kate McDonough and from Dignity in Schools campaign, and Meredith Mascara from Girl Scouts of Greater New York.
Terrific, welcome, and thank you for your patience. I know that was a lot. I think um, I, we're all very excited about your testimony. So maybe if we could hear all together from Girls for Gender Equity, and then we'll move on from there. Oh, just introduce yourself, and um, for the record, your name and where you're from. And I actually am going to ask the clerk. I'm sorry, but uh, for for. Um, if we could set the clock, gentlemen, for a two-minute limit, um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, Chair Traeger, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Barron, and council members and staff of the Committee on Education, Committee on Women and Gender Equity, and the Committee on Higher Education. My name is Brittany Brathwaite, and I'm the Organizing and Innovation Manager of Girls for Gender Equity. Thank you for holding this important hearing reading the, regarding the oversight of Title IX and gender discrimination in New York City. GGE is an intergenerational youth development and advocacy organization based here in New York City, committed to the physical, psychological, social, and economic development of cis and trans girls and gender nonconforming youth of color. For almost two decades, Girls for Gender Equity has organized around the guarantees of Title IX of the 1972 Education Amendment as a guidepost for equitable access to safety in schools for young people with a special attention to the racial and gender-based violence experienced by cisgender and transgender girls and gender nonconforming youth. Sexual harassment and violence is pervasive in our society and school system for young people. One in four young women experience sexual assault before they the age of 18, and for black girls, those numbers are even more stark, stark with six in 10 uh, reporting sexual assault before their 18th birthday. Our 2017 report, The School Girls Deserve, which surveyed over 100 girls and gender nonconforming youth of color in New York City revealed that one in three students experienced some form of sexual harassment in schools. While they reported experiencing sexual harassment in, to our research team, 90% of those students in the study revealed that they did not report it to their schools, most sharing that they did not know who to report it to or think that anything would be done. Title IX was created to protect students from gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and violence in school. And in our experience, the city has not prioritized its compliance. New York City currently has one Title IX coordinator for 1.1 million students in over 1,800 schools. We believe this response is insufficient and underscores that gender equity and sexual violence are not a priority for the New York City Department of Education. Similarly, schools like Chicago, the Chicago Public School District, which has one third of our student population, about 300,000 students, has a team of 20 full-time staff solely dedicated to Title IX training, compliance, coordination, and investigations. We're calling on the New York City Department of Education and the City of Council to advance the following. One, ensure equal protection for all students under Title IX by expanding the number of full-time Title IX coordinators to at least seven, with at least one of every borough citywide office in the five boroughs. The fiscal year's 2020 budget should include a total of $56,800 for these positions, fully funded by the Department of Education. We fully support Council Member Adams Resolution 797 that reflects this call to action. We also want to uh, expand the role of Title IX coordinators to ensure that these individuals are focusing on preventing sexual violence and gender discrimination in addition to responding when violence occurs. And lastly, we support the intent of Council Member Rosenthal's proposed reporting bill, Intro 1536. We strongly urge splitting this bill into two separate reporting bills, one requiring the New York City Department of Education to report on Title IX compliance to be posted on the DOE website once a year, disaggregated by race and gender together, and posted in a machine readable format and a separate bill requiring the Commission on Gender Equity to report on its activities in the previous 12 months. That is my time, but thank you, and we are committed to continuing conversations with this body. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, excuse me if I say your name wrong. Chair Traeger, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Barron, and council members and staff of the Committee on Education, Committee on Women and Commi Committee on Women and Gender Equity, and the Committee on Higher Education. My name is Umu Kaba, and I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior at Urban Assembly School for Global Commerce. I have never seen these posters the DOE spoke about, and I don't know who my sexual harassment. Liaison. Liaison is. 
I'm a first generation high school student and I identify as an African activist. I'm also a youth organizer with the Young Women's Advisory Council, YWAG at Girls for Gender Equity, who I am also here representing today. Girls for Gender Equity is an organization that teaches young women of color and gender non-conforming youth of people of color political and social justice education and then supports us in the community organizing and civic engagement to advance policy that affects us. GGE also supports us socially, emotionally, and mentally. On behalf of the Young Women's Advisory Council, I would like to thank you for having myself and my organization here. I really appreciate you taking the time to hear my voice and through this, I know my voice matters. I am testifying today because I want different communities to be aware of what girls of color like myself go through all the time in school and the trauma we have and can have because of this. The lack of tour Title IX coordinators in schools prevents us from feeling safe and being able to be ourselves in schools. When things happen to us, we're blamed for it and we have no one to report to or go to for support. In my school, the school safety agents make girls feel very uncomfortable. I remember one day my friend and I were in the hallway on our way to class and one of the security guards stopped us and began to fray with us and talk to us in a very non-consensual, romantic way. He then looked at us in a very sexual and objectifying manner. It made me feel like I was a piece of meat. He then tried to escort us to class even when we denied being escorted. This made my friend and I feel unsafe and confused. I felt like a sexual object and not a student and what left me feeling even more unprotected was that there was no one I could even share this story with. There was no one that would do anything. The people who were in my school to protect me were trying to hurt me. With the weather getting warmer, I also dread going to school because I know my administrators are going to police my body and dehumanize me. Last year when summer rolled around, I wore jeans that had rips in them. My principal instructed one of the teacher assistants to put cardboard box cardboard on my legs to cover the holes in my jeans. I was told that I would be distracting boys even though no matter what I'm wearing, boys cap call me in the hallways every day and no one does anything about it. My school condones rape culture and boys are always being catered to instead of understanding the perspective of girls of color in, in school. They continue to victim blame us and shame us. Title nine and title Title IX and Title IX coordinators. Excuse me, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Uh, and you need to know those last two paragraphs were the most powerful thing you could have ever said, and we learned a lot from you just now. Um, but sorry, I have to ask you to wrap up, and if everyone else could be mindful of the time. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Andrea Alejandra Gonzalez. I'm 18 years old. I'm a queer, indigenous, Latina activist. Um, and I'm part of the Young Women's Advisory Council at GGE. Um, girls of color are hypersexualized constantly. We're often forgotten when addressing sexual harassment. When I was in high school, I was always the first to get dress coded, and I was heavily surveilled for what I wore. I knew this was only because I was Latina and my school administrators, saw, at school administrators saw my body as a distraction in comparison to my white counterparts who were able to wear and dress however they wanted to, and however they felt comfortable. And to talk about what DOE said up here, I never saw any of these posters that they were talking about. I never saw any of the cards and I never knew who my sexual assault liaison was. These, this information was never given to us and I'm almost certain that if you asked any high school student, they wouldn't know either. Being judged every day by what I wore led me to feel unsafe and uncomfortable in my school, especially in warmer weather. I should have not changed the way I look just because teachers and other students might get distracted. The teachers should change and not me. In my high school, the emphasis on what I chose to wear and not wear was measured by what would cause teachers to sexualize my body. And now I attend a CUNY, and this is my first year within the school system. We're only a few months in, and there's been various reports of professors sexually harassing students, and I am afraid. These reports paired with my experiences from high school shows me that this continues to be an issue across most educational spaces and is absolutely unacceptable. Why isn't there action being taken against these teachers? Why, isn't there, why is there only one Title IX coordinator for 1.1 million students in New York City? And why are students' bodies more important than their education in school? I hope to bring awareness to these narratives of young cis and trans girls of color and gender nonconforming youth of color to make sure these stories of harassment are 
and unfair dress codes are not being erased. The lack of Title IX coordinators in New York City is appalling and concerning. How can you know all this information and not be concerned? Girls of color and gender non-conforming youth of color deserve better and they deserve to be and feel respected in their educational spaces. Hiring seven full-time and trained Title IX coordinators can help ensure that young people are being respected and treated with the dignity they deserve. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger, Chair Rosotho, and Chair Barron, and Council members and staff of Committee on Education, Committee on Women and Gender Equi Equity, and the Committee on Higher Education. My name is Bernice Gervasio, and I am 15 years old. I am currently a sophomore in high school, attending high school for environmental studies. I identify as size girl, and I am first generation Mexican American. I'm in a program called Stitches and Strength, which is run by Gender Girls Equity, who I'm also here representing today. I am a soccer player and I'm on the school's, school's all-girls soccer team. Title IX is crucial to ensuring that I get to play sports at school and also that I get to show up at, a, at school the way I want to and be safe in my body. I want to tell you a couple stories of what I experienced at school. When I first joined the girls soccer team freshman year, students and teachers treated us as a joke. We were held to lower standards just because they thought the boys were so much better simply for being boys. They were taken seriously. We were made fun of just be, for being girls playing the sport. This year, we made, made major accomplishments as a team. We made it to playoffs and semifinals for the first time in eight years. Meanwhile, the boys only went to playoffs but lost after the second round. They were still perceived praise and accolades, which they deserve, but it took us advancing to the semifinals to receive recognition from the school community. They were finally saying girls could play this game too. During our summer trials, when it was all sorts of honey, hot, sunny, and humid, my teammates couldn't handle the heat, so they took their shirts off. We had been working out so hard and they just wanted to keep on going. They thought it was okay since we saw other girls in practi practicing with only the sports bras. Our coach, our coach had an immediate reaction. He started feeling some type of way, which of course meant he was judging us. He immediately lectured us about why it was wrong to take our shirts off and it was wrong to wear sports bras outside. Even though I wasn't one of the people who took off their shirts, I still had a reaction. I knew he was trying to protect us, but the response was inappropriate. First, he was our coach and school should should be supporting us. He was blaming us for potential responses from others as we were asking to be catcalled. Three, there were other girls and guys who didn't have any shirts on. Those teams were mostly made of people I perceived as white. So why was it not okay for us to wear our sports bras? He said it was to protect us, but, we were, but what we are wearing should never be a reason for people to hurt us, and we should definitely aren't giving consent for random people to touch us or engage in sexual harassment. Our coach is a caring and supportive person. We know that he has the best interests at heart and also he needs more training and support to coach an all-girls team. Our, lang our school needs more training and support to be in equitable language and responses to girls playing sports and being athletes. I believe an increase in Title of Nine coordinators will help us give us support to our staff and change school culture. They can look out for what sorts of trainings and messages are occurring in schools. Additionally, I don't feel comfortable wearing clothing that's tight or shows off skin in school. And it's not because- Summarize yes. it just okay. a little bit, thank so you. So I don't feel comfortable wearing um, tight clothes or that shows off skin. And it's not because I don't hold that clothing, but I, hear, I always hear things saying, you're showing off too much skin, too much skin, or I get discriminated because of my body type. This is unacceptable. I shouldn't feel this any type of way because of the clothing I choose to wear. I have fear expressing my true self. I am scared to be shamed and called names because of the clothes I choose to wear. I'm scared of being sexually harassed by the students at my school. I see a lot of boundaries being crossed at school and the adults aren't doing anything about it. I feel like they don't know what to do. Then what if I was dressed the way I was wanted to something happen? Who do I go to? Who do I am I supposed to when I have this issue? Yeah. Oh wait, um, I wanna add something else, okay. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So today's staff from DOE said that they informed students about their rights and Title IX information. I have never received any type of information at school, especially when we first started. Not in a poster or in a pamphlet or any type of way, especially from a teacher or a principal. Luckily, I have my rap coordinator, but not all schools have this, and they don't also have the power to make change through the entire school. Thank you for having me. Hi, um, my name's Kate McDonough. I'm the director of Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, of which Gigi is a wonderful member of. 
Um, we're a multi-stakeholder coalition of students, parents, educators, organizers, and advocates who work for education justice and the end uh, to school push out and the school to prison pipeline. Um, just be quick. So I think many years, um, due to many efforts of others, there's been a focus on ensuring that young people, especially young people of color, aren't pushed out of school, which has led to uh, increased attention on reducing the number of suspensions. However, simply focusing on suspensions alone is not enough, as we have heard today. Um, what you have all have shared is a form of school push out and addressing sexual harassment in school should be a top priority. Um, as the city determines what kind of budget uh, we're going to have, it's important to keep in mind that you get what you pay for. Um, so now I'd say it's the time to transform our school system by investing in things that young people want, need, and deserve. Now is the time to have a Title IX coordinator in every um, borough support office so that schools can have access to the resources that they need to create cultures of consent and address sexual harassment. Um, I think it's also important to uplift that we spend over $400 million on the NYPD school safety division budget. We have more school safety agents than we have guidance counselors and social workers combined, and yet um, our city will only invest $1.3 million on implementing restorative justice in schools. So again, you get what you pay for. Um, our coalition has a budget demand of investing $56.4 million in restorative justice so that it can be taken citywide. Uh, we're also calling for an increase in school guidance counselors and social workers um, in addition to supporting the demands of Girls for Gender Equity. So that is it. Thank you. I, tell you, I am so proud, so proud of, of, of these amazing students. Uh, thank you for sharing very powerful and very personal testimony and turning your pain into purpose to help yourselves and, and your peers. Um, and just very briefly, I, I think you've touched upon some of the issues that, but because we heard quite a bit from the DOE earlier about all the personnel that they have that are supposed to support you and be there for you. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have received a brochure detailing your Title IX rights. By a show of hands, how many of you received support from a climate, school climate manager? By a show of hands, how many of you have never heard of a school climate manager? That is all I think we need to know. I think what that brief exercise could have been in place of the three hour long testimony we heard from the administration. Um, thank you, your, your voices, your needs, the needs of, of your peers, that should be driving our budget process. And you've just made a very powerful case for more Title IX coordinators more social workers and counselors in our schools. Thank you so much. Ooh, I get to say I'm proud of you now. So um, I would like to agree with Chair Traeger. Your testimony blew us away. Um, it is because of your personal stories and in particular about the school safety officers and about summer coming up that I think we're gonna tweak the legislation and try to capture some additional little points. So I really wanna thank you for that. And to build on what Chair Trigger just said, I feel that you, the testimony here reflects a deeper understanding of why this education is important. Each of your stories is about um, the climate that you're in uh, is not conducive to learning. And you've explained it very well. And I'm sorry the DOE didn't stay here. There's one person from DOE who stayed here uh, to really hear and understand what you said. Um, but we're here. And we heard you. 
and we want to thank you for that. It is striking that the statistic reported here is one in three students experience sexual harassment. And yet, what we heard from the DOE is that of the 1.1 million students, not even 1% are heard. Thank you so much for coming here today and for staying late. We appreciate you. I'd like to call up the next panel, um, which is Emma Roth um, from the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Abigail um, De Delgado, I'm sure I said that wrong. Ayala uh, Logan, Ay Ayala Logan. Um, Shawali Patel. Catherine Cohen and Carrie Goldberg. Can we just make sure that Chris Cohen is here? Oh, and can I just confirm uh, that Meredith Massara from the Girl Scouts has she already left? Okay. She's we cold, just to keep okay. Um, and and we have everyone's testimony, and people can still submit it. All of which will be read meticulously. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Should she go first? Okay, thank you. If we could begin over here with you, just, uh, just say your name, what organization you're with, and unfortunately, we have to be on a two minute clock. Thank you. Yes, um, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today to discuss this very important issue. Um, I'm going to give a very condensed version of the written testimony that's gonna be handed to you. Uh, my name is Catherine Cohen, and I'm a law fellow with Lambda Legal, which is the oldest and largest legal organization whose mission is to achieve the full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexual, transgender people, and everyone living with HIV. I am here today in support of requiring reporting on Title IX compliance and expanding the number of Title IX coordinators. Um, we appreciate the intent of this resolution and would encourage it to go e even further, placing a Title IX coordinator in every school as recommended by Girls for Gender Equity's report and, while not required by Title IX, consistent with federal guidance from the Obama Administration Department of Education Dear Colleague letter that was rescinded. Um, Title IX is incredibly important to LGBTQ youth in schools, particularly transgender and gender nonconforming young people. LGBTQ youth are subject to higher rates of harassment and abuse in schools, as well as disproportionate rates of school push out. Um, they're also more likely to report sexual harassment and abuse, um, including sexual violence. School push out and discrimination are linked with significant overrepresentation of LGBTQ youth in juvenile justice and homelessness systems, um, where they make up 20% of juvenile justice system involved youth and almost 50% of homeless youth, despite being only 5 to 7% of the general population. Title IX is an essential tool in addressing these harmful disparities. Federal courts have agreed that sex discrimination prohibited by Title IX also includes sexual harassment and discrimination for failing to conform to gender stereotypes, which allows LGBTQ youth to rely on Title IX's protections in several cases. Um, for example, in one case, in Adams v. the School Board of St. John's County, Lambda Legal represented a transgender student who was prohibited from using the uh, bathroom that was associated with their gender identity prior to a federal court finding that this likely violated Title IX. Um, stories like these demonstrate the incredible importance of Title IX, but get the report shows that it is be, the promise of Title IX is falling short in New York, and for those reasons, we recommend the passage of these bills. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Abigail Delgado. I'm a senior at the American Sign Language Secondary English High School. I'm also a member of the New York Civil Liberties Union's Teen Activist Project, a youth organizing program with nearly 200 members focused on developing and engaging young leaders as activists in their schools and communities. Did you know that in one in three students has experienced sexual harassment? When I was younger, I, was, I experienced sexual abuse. Where was my Title IX coordinator? 
It is that person's responsibility to make sure children feel safe and supported at school and free from sexual violence. But unfortunately, in my situation, I was let down, not only by the Title IX coordinator, but by the Department of Education. This experience changed my life completely. It made me fearful and cautious of my surroundings. I no longer wear skirts. I have had to deal with this trauma since a young age. Even now, I do everything I can to not let this experience define me. I am not afraid to speak up anymore. Today, I'm here to urge the Department of Education and the City Council to work together to increase the number of Title IX coordinators in our public schools. One is simply not enough. There are 1.1 million students in the New York City public school system. And surely, one person cannot account for all of those students' experiences and issues. With only one person responsible for this job, how can students adequately identify this person and know how to reach them or file a complaint? There's no way that one person can be in multiple schools at the same time. We need to have at least one title coordinator in every borough. One in each borough is a great start. We should aim for even more than that. We need Title IX coordinators looking for every child, no, sorry, looking for after every child in school to make sure that our schools are not letting them down and are helping them to succeed. The Title IX coordinator can work alongside the respect for all nations to ensure that bullying and harassment is reported and monitored. The respect for all nations is a, is a trained staff person that should understand how to respond to and report bullying and harassment. Why are they not working together? Let's identify ways for these two individuals to work together and make sure that all students' voices are heard. In order for this to happen, the Department of Education needs to make sure that students know how the correct respect for all nations is. We just finished an, our annual survey for our, of our peers and found out that 594 respondents, only 17% knew who the correct person was. So if the Title IX coordinator is supported by the R R sorry, RFA Lation, there needs to be better transparency regarding who these individuals are. Lastly, it is really important that students are taught compre sorry, comprehensively sexuality education that meets the national sex education standards. It's great that we want to have these, these sorry, to have these educators as people who students can come to, but we need to stop harassment before it even gets there. We need mandated sex education that teaches about consent and healthy relationships. It is my understanding that we have tax force right now that are monitoring how sex education is operating in New York City. Let's make sure sex education is comprehensive, inclusive, medically accurate, and teaches about consent. This makes a huge difference. We can make these changes and we can make them now. Let's work together to make sure all students feel safe and welcome at school. Thank you for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Aaliyah Logan and I'm a 17 year old Jamaican American teen advocate from the Bronx. I'm an active member of the NYCLU Teen Activist Project where we focus on ensuring that students have an accessibility to an equitable education. In New York City, uh, there are many ways that students of color and other marginalized communities are held back from reaching our fullest potential in our academic career. As a woman of color, I understand the importance of giving resources to underserved communities to ensure of our success. I am a junior at NYC High School, and throughout my years attending public schools, I continue to face racial and gender charge discrimination. These teachers make comments attacking my identity as a black woman because of their lack of knowledge of my intersectional identity. I have attended schools that have a strict dress code towards students. Strict dress, code, dress codes are the direct way that schools uphold patriarchal and racist stereotypes for specific students. The over-sexualization of black girls has been implemented in New York City schools, and this must stop now. Gen gender discrimination should not be termed, deemed as unimportant because it's directly impacting 1.1 million students in New York City. Title IX is extremely crucial to ensuring that students like myself are given a safe learning environment to succeed in. It is unacceptable that there is one person for 1. 1.1 million students. This, the Title IX coordinator deals with sex discrimination and concerns related to gender identity and gender expression. It is impossible for one person to fully accommodate each student. By having one person, you are showing the students of New York City that you do not care about the sexual discrimination that marginalized communities face. You are showing us that our stories are not important. 
To all the members listening today, I want to stress the importance of having at least one coordinator in each borough. But this is not the solution. We need more than one for each borough. We need multiple. I am lucky enough to have a to attend a school that gives a quality sexual education, but there are many students in low-income communities that do not receive the sexual education that they deserve. We have to change the curriculum of sexual education to include discussions on the point of consent. I'm an active member in the Mayor's sex Sexual Health Education Task Force, where we are trying to reshape and reform sexual ed for sex ed for students. I've also heard uh, DOE me members mention the respect for org um, coordinator, which would, would be someone who would work with the Title IX coordinator, but students need to know who this person is first. Like Abigail stated, the NYCLU surveyed 600 peers this year and only 17%, 17% knew who the person was. The rest did not know. Um, I want to ask people today, what is stopping you from making an an effective change in our education. You have the funds to hire more Title IX coordinators. You have the resources to provide comprehensive, medically accurate, age appropriate, honest, consent informed, LGBTQ inclusive, and trauma and healing informed sexual education. Each of you hold the power to make change in our communities and our education. It is time for you to start investing in our education. Thank you. Thank you, and um, if you could turn in or, or email, we're gonna give you a card. Your testimony is very powerful, thank you. Hi, my name is Carrie Goldberg, and I'm a victim's rights lawyer in Brooklyn. And my law firm fights um, for harassment, or fights against harassment and, and assault. I'm, really, really mad. I'm really, really mad that those DOE administrators left this building before hearing what these, what these students had to say. I'm really mad. <laughs> and, and it is such a perfectly accurate demonstration of their indifference, their denial, their arrogance, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to see it. My firm is responsible for three uh, civil rights uh, reports to the Office for Civil Rights and investigations into the uh, New York City Department of Education based on Title IX violations, and we're responsible for three uh, federal lawsuits against the city of New York for DOE's Title IX violations. Um, I don't want any more of these cases. I will keep bringing these cases. And one of the main facts I talk about in my cases is that there is one Title IX coordinator for this many people. We've heard that over and over and over again. And there's no way that one person can, can do the job of what we need an army for. Um, my first client was a girl of color who was uh, recorded in eighth grade being raped and the video was circulated around her entire school and she was asked to leave because she was a distraction and they, she didn't come to school for weeks, they didn't ask about her, there was no investigation. My second client was sexually assaulted in a stairwell by seven boys, girl of color, and she was um, suspended. She was suspended. She has very observable learning disabilities. She was suspended when she reported that she'd been gang raped in a stairwell. And then my third client, she was tackled to the floor, pinned by two boys, and then dry humped. All these girls are students in Brooklyn, girls of color, um, and those administrators left. Uh, I, I um, have written a book. There's an entire chapter about New York City DOE's indifference. I'll let you read that. Uh, it uh, explains it much better than I am, but uh, thank you for letting us inside today. I'm so grateful to be here. And I heard your, um, your, your speech at the rally. It was very powerful, and your, your clients are lucky to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, and thank you to the City Council for convening this important hearing. 
My name is Emma Roth, and I'm a legal fellow with the ACLU Women's Rights Project. I'm here today on behalf of the ACLU and the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is the, New York's, uh, which is the ACLU's New York affiliate. Sexual harassment in schools is a pervasive problem that the New York City Council and Department of Education must not ignore. As we already heard from my partners at Girls for Gender Equity, there are extremely high rates of sexual harassment in New York, and the vast majority of incidents go unreported. Experiences of sexual harassment and assault are often disruptive to students' educational lives, causing them to stop participating in class or activities, or even drop out of school altogether. These effects have profound implications for students' long-term ability to find stable employment and participate fully in social, political, and economic life. New York City has the largest public school district in the entire country, yet a single Title IX coordinator. The ACLU and New York Civil Liberties Union support Resolution 797 that would call upon the Department of Education to maintain at least seven Title IX coordinator positions across the city. We would support the designation of even more Title IX coordinators than that because seven is likely not enough. Even though there's only one Title IX coordinator in New York City under state law, Every school is required to have at least one designated staff member to assist students with issues of bullying, harassment, and discrimination. In New York City, the staff member is called a respect for all liaison. As the NYCLU incredible teen activists already testified, in their survey earlier this year, only 17% of students could correctly identify the respect for all liaison for their school. We therefore urge DOE to initiate a public education campaign so that New York City students are aware of their rights under Title IX, the identity of their respect for, for all liaison, and the fact that they can report sexual harassment and assault to the in-school liaison in addition to reporting to the Title IX coordinator. But importantly, I want to note that the respect for all liaisons are not meant to be a substitute for Title IX coordinators, as DOE would have you believe today. In fact, they're meant to be an additional on-the-ground resource for students, but New York City is not off the hook. It must hire more than one Title IX coordinator. Thank you to the City Council for providing this opportunity. We look forward to working together to promote safe and equitable schools for all students. Thank you all very much for the work that you do. Um, you mentioned three uh, Title IX cases brought against the city. Does anyone have a sense of how many Title IX cases the city is currently uh, dealing with? Or a sense, is it more than three? It's okay if you don't know. We, we couldn't get the information. I know of five um, that my firm's been involved in, and certainly the new one that was filed today um, would increase the number. Not all of those are, are uh, New York City DOE. Thank you. And um, on, on my bill, 1536, is it easy to get the information that this report would call for? Is it easy to access now? And do you have any other ideas, and you can get this to us afterward, of additional data points that should be included in that report? Can you clarify, City Council Member, what um, data you're asking if it's easier to obtain? Um, for example, uh, the report has to include information on the city's compliance um, with Title IX, um, including the number of complaints regarding Title IX violations received, disaggregated by agency, the number of complaints that were substantiated and unsubstantiated, categories of complaints where applicable, any barriers to compliance, um, vacancies in the Title IX coordinator position, and um, recommendations for next steps. And my question is, as lawyers now, do you find it's easy to access this information um, currently because we're 
hearing, the feedback we're hearing is that this information is duplicative, it's already out there. And secondly, if you would have additional suggestions of additional data points we should be asking for. Um, I'll, I'll speak um, for myself. I did not know this information was even publicly available. I remember being um, on the, the um, stairs testifying with Tish James when she was public advocate and we were asking for information, this kind of information, and I didn't know that it had ever been presented. Um, or was publicly available. This delights me. I don't know where to find it, uh, but this is, this is a great start. Um, additional data points that I'm looking at just off the top of my head is, um, you know, I have a concern so many of my, um, of the individuals who've come to me have come to me because they've been retaliated against. They've been disciplined or suspended because of, or after going and reporting a sexually violent experience. And I want to know what happens, what happens, um, you know, what's happened to them? You know, we've we talk about school push out, and I, I think it happens to people who are sexually assaulted and, and, and disciplined. Um, I'm also deeply concerned about the vast number of complaints, I would suspect, that aren't being classified as, as Title IX complaints, where, uh, again, cases where the student's being disciplined, and yeah. it never gets into the funnel, it never gets investigated. Every single case that I've had has been that, so I don't think they would even register. So I'd like to know, I'd like the city council to be looking at every case of quote-unquote consensual sex uh, that is being disciplined within the DOE to see if some of those cases might be actually non-consensual sexual encounters that have been misclassified. And I think that goes a bit beyond our powers, but even the notion of adding the data point, how many times has consensual sex uh, is being reported in the school and what grade? Yes. What grade? Yes. Was that in? What great. Yeah. Thank you. If I uh, may just quickly add, um, I agree with Gary. There's a complete and total lack of transparency. This data is nearly impossible to find. I agree everything in here would be helpful. And in addition, um, to have this data about complaints disaggregated by race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability status, because we know from national data that certain groups of students who have marginalized identity experience sexual harassment and assault at disproportionate rates. And I would also add that it would be helpful to have data on the remedies requested by complainants, including interim measures that they requested, and what remedies were actually provided. Uh, because if all we know is the number of complaints and whether there was a finding of responsibility or non-responsibility, but we don't know what the school has done to actually follow up on that complaint and make sure there's a safe and equitable learning environment for all students, then students will still feel unprotected. And if you could help us think about exactly that point, um, as I was trying to get the answer to that question from DOE today, um, it's very easy for them to say, oh, we send somebody to a program. Right. So we would want to collect the data in such a way so as to require them to uh, yeah, to, to document, show a little more. To document both interim measures and also final remedies provided to complainants, and so that might be access to counseling, that might be that a complainant needs to have their schedule or the respondent's class schedule changed if they have a no contact order or something to that effect. Um, you know, and that's exactly what I was hoping they would say as an example of a remedy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think someone who thinks about this all the time, that's why that just pops to mind for you. Right, and, and I would just add that I think this kind of data is so essential in order to identify systemic patterns of discrimination. We need to know where these things are happening, where there are repeat problems, and where complaints are not being sufficiently redressed. We'll never be able to identify those patterns if we don't have data. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank very you. helpful. Um, I just, sorry, I just wanted Please. to echo uh, the request for disaggregation of data, and especially um, thinking about LGBT young people, um, whether or not the incident was motivated by actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, um, exactly. to get both at the demographics of the students, but also the motivation behind some of these incidents. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Miriam Mohammed, Sophia Quinton, Amanda Rufnozo Pali, Diane Milutinovich, Sandy Vives, Elizabeth Flores Amaya, and Sarah Fatlis Axelson. Thank you. Okay, again, with apologies, we need to limit the amount of time for your testimony to two minutes. Um, and again, we have, your testimony is in the record. So it will be scrutinized and read. If you want to just say who you are, what organization you're from, and what's the big takeaway at this juncture, that would be incredibly helpful. Would you like to start? Good afternoon, my name is Miriam Mohammed, and I'm a government relations associate at Planned Parenthood of New York City and I'm reading a very condensed version of the testimony we submitted today. Um, I would like to thank uh, the committees on women and gender equity, education and higher education and committee chairs, council members Mark Traeger, Helen Rosenthal and Inez Barron for holding this important oversight hearing on gender discrimination and Title IX compliance in New York City. Planned Parenthood of New York City has been a leading healthcare provider of sexual and reproductive health services for over 100 years. Uh, PPNYC um, also has a robust education department, which includes our Youth Health Promoters Program um, that provides tools to youth participants to make informed decisions and lead healthy lives. Our Youth Health Promoters also engage young people, their peers, and conduct uh, interactive workshops to educate young teens about their rights and access to sexual and reproductive health care and overcome, overcome barriers and stigma that teens may experience in accessing care. PPINYC supports the measures to ensure New York City is in compliance with Title IX law, especially within our public school system. Title IX is critical to ensuring all students are able to have an educational experience free from um, fear of harassment and discrimination. Currently, the DOE has one Title IX coordinator overseeing compliance for, of the law for 1.1 million students and 1,800 schools. PPNYC urges the council to pass resolution 0797-2019, which calls on the DOE to hire seven additional Title IX coordinators with at least one designated at each of the borough field support offices. Implementation of comprehensive sexuality education is another means through which gender-based discrimination and harassment can be reduced. We also strongly urge the Department of Education to adopt measures to ensure New York City students are receiving comprehensive sexuality education through adopting the policy recommendations of the Mayor's Sex Sexual Health Education Task Force. The recommendations include increasing the, qu the quantity of health education across all grade levels, requiring schools to provide health education from a certified health instructor, and strengthening accountability and reporting measures. During a time when the federal government has increased efforts to curb access to comprehensive sexuality education and focus on abstinence only, risk avoidance, education, and healthcare, it is important that New York City adopt measures that ensure students have access to sexuality education to promote positive youth development, healthy relationships, and communications. 
We applaud the New York City Council to its, to its commitment to ensuring students and school communities take the necessary steps to address gender-based violence and, act, and have access to sexuality and a se comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you. Thank you. If people could try to summarize their testimony, that'd be great. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal. Um, my name is Sofia Quintero, and I'm the Director of Training and Professional Development for Girls, Inc. of New York City. Girls, Inc. is a national organization that inspires all girls to be strong, smart, and bold through direct service and advocacy. We have 80 local affiliates in the U.S. and Canada serving girls 6 to 18, primarily through after-school and summer programs. Girls, Inc. of New York City works in partnerships with schools and community-based organizations, and in the past school year, we serve 7,500 New York City girls in over 60 sites, anywhere from Far Rockaway, East Harlem, Astoria, and South Bronx. In 2016, Girls Inc. National surveyed middle and high school girls across our network and found that sexual harassment and sexual violence were top issues of concern. And this is no surprise to our staff because we hear every single day from girls about the harassment they face in school, on the way to and from school, online and at parties. In 2018, Girls Inc. launched a national advocacy campaign called Hashtag Girls 2 with the tagline Respect Starts Young to help raise awareness about sexual harassment and assault in the lives of youth, particularly girls, and to date over 20,000 people have taken the Girls 2 pledge. Now, our, the written testimony that we've submitted offers more statistics that you're probably already familiar with, so I just wanna use my limited time with you to tell you about one experience that I had when I was running a Girls Inc. program in a public middle school here in New York City. Um, I was walking through the stairwell between classes when I overheard several boys on the other side of the stairwell, and one of them said, where's this girl at? To which his friend replied, don't worry, she's coming. When I reached the landing, I found the gentleman who worked in the school who part of his responsibility is supposed to be monitoring the corridors and ushering young people to class. And shaking, I said to him, there are a group of boys waiting in the staircase for a girl to arrive for I don't know what. And he just stared at me. So I blurted out what I thought would make him move. And I said, you better chase them back to class before your school ends up in the news for the bad reason. And the reason why I say that is because the majority leader had mentioned that at the press conference, that that's not sometimes what it takes to make people act and intervene. Now, I admit that there are times when I've wondered if I might have overreacted in that situation. But I remember nationally that more than two out of three girls and over half of boys report being sexually harassed at some point in school, and that girls who experience sexual harassment and assault also have a higher risk of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, chronic pain, substance abuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So maybe I overreacted, but I'm not gonna err on the side of protecting all the youth in that situation, the, the girl and the boys. So in addition to what our colleagues here have said today, um, in terms of calling for, for at least seven full-time Title IX coordinators. Um, it should be allocated in the New York City Council budget to, in the fiscal 2020 budget, $856,800 for that purpose. But based on my experience, I also want to reiterate that the role of Title IX coordinators has to be clarified to ensure that they're focusing on preventing sexual violence and harassment and not just responding to incidents that have been report, reported. So Girls Inc. supports Girls for Gender Equity School Girls Deserves campaign and will continue to push New York City to foster safe and supportive school environments so all our young people can be free of gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, Chair Barron uh, and fellow advocates. My name is Sarah Axelson, and I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy at the Women's Sports Foundation, a national nonprofit based here in New York City with our headquarters. Um, obviously, we understand that today's hearing was mainly, um, the main impetus has been sexual violence and sexual harassment, and we think that that is a very important conversation to have. We bring uh, a viewpoint of sports today and just wanna add in a little bit more about what Title IX does cover with sports. Um, Sports provide increased physical and psychological health and academic outcomes and leadership skills. 
and we that is because it is an educational experience and it provides that educational opportunity to students in our schools. We're excited to see and, and thrilled that the City Council is considering additional funding for additional Title IX coordinators. As we've seen today, far too often, the burden of compliance with the law is placed on the person who is discriminated against, and it is crucial that these additional Title IX coordinators are well-trained and equipped to handle all aspects of the law. Uh, in the reporting requirements for Title IX that we see as being considered as well in Title IX-related statistics, while the full text of this legislation calls out tracking of specific items like complaints, we would like to ask that you consider also collecting information as it relates to athletics in Title IX. Looking at the Federal Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act, which was passed in 1994, which applies to all colleges, as an example of the types of statistics which could be collected and reported. This is not without precedent at more local levels for high schools, as some states have enacted their own similar laws as well. Data transparency is critical in allowing students, parents, and constituents to understand how a school divides its sports opportunities and the budgets associated with it. This information would also let them know when it is within their rights to ask for new opportunities or additional benefits and services. Information which would have been helpful when two student athletes from New York City schools called the Women's Sports Foundation to ask how it could be that boys on a track and field team were provided Metro cards, but the girls on the team were not. I ask that you do everything within your power to afford students in New York City schools an environment free from all aspects of sex-based discrimination so they can thrive and become tomorrow's leaders. Thank you. Uh, next panelist. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Flores Amaya, and I am the Associate Director of Community Impact at the Women's Sports Foundation. Since Title IX has become a federal law in 1972, much progress has been made in ensuring girls and women are afforded equitable opportunities through federally funded programs, yet there is much to be done from preventing sexual harassment and violence in schools to making sure that girls have access to quality sports programming in a safe environment. On behalf of the Women's Sports Foundation, I am pleased to join the discussion today with the city council members and fellow advocates about the transformational role that sports and physical activity play in shaping the lives of girls. We, know, we also know from the Women's Sports Foundation research, teen sports in America, that we're, we still have a long way to go for gender equity. And who are the girls who are not playing sports? The greatest disparities are with girls in underserved communities, girls with disabilities, immigrant girls, African American, Hispanic, and Native American girls, who on average enter sports at a later age, participate in lower numbers, and drop out earlier than, than their white counterparts. I speak on behalf of over 150 plus community partners who provide free out of school programs when I say that we can do better in offering a school based program sports participation opportunities for girls. Despite Title IX being in place when I was in high school, my district lacked adequate sports programs. Today, more than 20 years after I was in high school, many girls, especially Hispanic girls, like I once, wa I once was, and African American girls still lack access to sports opportunities. Although there are out of school um, girl girls athletic options, most are unaffordable to girls and families who live in the community. As a parent, one of my top priorities is to ensure that my daughter and girls like her have access to the benefits and the life skills that sports have to offer, regardless of their gender, the color of their skin, and their zip code. I urge you to do what's in your power to make sure that New York City schools provide equitable access and opportunities for all girls and all women to participate and thrive in a safe environment free of bias and harassment. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sandy Vivas. I am the former co-chair of the Women's Sports Foundation. I won't repeat what some of my colleagues have said here today, but what I do want to say is that there is no objective way to monitor Title IX compliance without data and statistics. These measures take the emotion out of the equation in determining deficiencies and or, and or inequities while monitoring trends of participation. Including rigorous statistical information about Title IX compliance in the city's annual report will assist educators, the DOE, the council, in their allocation of resources towards affording the opportunities for physical activity and sport that was the promise of Title IX to all the city's students. Good afternoon or good evening. 
My name is Diane Milutinovich. I'm a member of the Women's Sports Foundation Advocacy Committee and a member of ATIXA. There is an association of Title IX administrators that uh, c covers Title IX compliance and Title IX coordinators. There are over 25,000 professionals in the, uh, in, the, in the United States who have uh, responsibilities for Title IX coordination. So it's difficult for me to understand how DOE can't find a Title IX coordinator. It's, uh, as my colleagues have said here, it's extremely important that we collect data, not only uh, the collection of data, but without data, we cannot hold people accountable for their actions and for the, the disparities and, and inequities that happen, and we can only correct those disparities and inequities if we know about them, and data helps us get there in an objective way. So it is critically important that we have enough administrators, Title IX coordinators, and, and nine uh, is, is a good start, like it has been said previously, but we definitely need to have more, and we need to have the data made public so we can hold people accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Barron and all of the members and advocates, and thank you to everyone who has spoken today. My name is Amanda reynoso Pali. I am a staff attorney at Day One. Uh, Day One is the only New York organization committing its full resources to addressing dating violence among youth 24 years of age and under. We work to create a world without dating violence by delivering a combination of services that include social services, legal advocacy for young survivors of dating violence, leadership development for teenagers, and preventative education for students in kindergarten through college. Dating violence among young people is a serious issue within New York City's public schools. Within the past year, 10% of New York City high school students report experiencing physical violence in a dating relationship, and 15.4% report experiencing sexual violence in a dating relationship. In our 15 years of experience in this area, we have seen that students experiencing dating violence often fall behind in school, experience an increase in absences, or never graduate. I started at day one as a postgraduate legal fellow focusing on advocating for high school students experiencing dating violence. A lot of my focus focused on advocating for protections available under Title IX. Um, with the changes happening at the federal level to Title IX, it is imperative that states and local governments enact and enforce stronger protections for students experiencing gender discrimination on campus. Dating violence is a form of gender-based discrimination. We at day one ask that City Council and the New York City Department of Education step in to protect young survivors harmed by the federal changes to the enforcement of Title IX. Um, specifically, we stand by Girls for Gender Equity's call that there be at least seven Title IX coordinators with at least one coordinator at each borough field support center. In an ideal world, we would like to see one Title IX coordinator at every single DOE high school um, and middle school as well. Uh, these coordinators must focus on all forms of gender-based discrimination, and they must be trained on the ways that sexual harassment can affect students' education regardless of whether the harassment occurs on or off campus. Um, I would also just like to add that in my experience training uh, many DOE professionals and staff that I have often asked them if they are aware of Chancellor's Regulation A831, which we heard so much about today from the DOE speakers, and so many of them have never heard about it, do not know it exists. I have spoken to a student-on-student um, -student sexual harassment liaison who did not know they were that liaison at their campus. So clearly, DOE has a lot of work to do on this. Um, they should be enforcing this regulation. They should be ensuring that all schools know it exists, that all students are aware of it, that they are, uh, that they are also aware of who the person is on their campus. And ideally, that person on their campus, it should be their only job. Um, I have submitted a host of other proposals as well on behalf of day one. A very important one that I would like to prop up that some of the other young people were saying is just that for us to end gender-based discrimination and sexual harassment and dating violence, it is important that our young people are learning about what that is, what that looks like, and being able to identify those behaviors. Um, so we would hope that the DOE would ensure that young people and the professionals that work with young people are being trained on that. Um, we support Council Member Rosenthal's amendment to the administrative code. Uh, we would ask that the commission be further expanded to include members working in community-based organizations with young survivors of sexual assault, dating violence, and technology abuse. Thank you for allowing us to speak to these issues. Uh, we would be honored to partner with you in the future on this. 
I want to thank the panel for coming and sharing their experiences and offering their recommendations. We thank you for coming. Thank you. This is the next panel. And with that, we'll call the next panel. We have Simone Gamble from the Brotherhood Sister Soul, Juliet Veringia from Anti-Violence Project, Nastia Garadilova from the New York Alliance Against Sexual Assault, and Charlotte Kaysen from New York Law School. If I've mispronounced your name, please give me the con correct pronunciation when you introduce yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you so much. If you could, if you would like to start. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Um, there's plenty written um, in my written testimony, but my name is Juliet Varengia. Um, I'm from the Anti-Violence Project. Um, AVP supports LGBTQ survivors of hate violence, sexual violence, dating violence, um, and we run a national coalition of anti-violence programs, which consists of 50 LGBTQ and HIV-impacted groups um, across the country doing similar work. Um, I'm here um, in partnership with Girls for Gender Equity to reinforce and support their um, advocacy for seven more full-time, fully trained Title IX coordinators for New York City public schools. Thank you. My name is Charlotte Kaysen and I am a law student at New York Law School. I speak on behalf of the Cyber Harassment Clinic at New York Law School. As part of the New York Law School's Institute for Cyber Safety, the clinic is the first of its kind law school pro bono clinic helping victims of cyber harassment obtain justice. The clinic focuses on raising awareness about cyber harassment and to provide direct services to victims of non-consensual pornography, cyberbullying, and other forms of online harassment. Through legal advocacy and policy analysis, we believe that cyber harassment can be a form of gender discrimination and therefore can interfere with a student's right to an education free from discrimination under Title IX. Taunts, slurs, and humili humiliating images can be easily disseminated to an entire student body at the click of a button. According to the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, among New York City public high school students, 13.3% of high school students reported being e-bullied within the past year. In an environment where federal protections under Title IX are being rolled back or weakened, New York City has the opportunity to step up and strengthen procedures. We applaud that the council is taking action through these resolutions. We want to note that protection from sexual and gender-based harassment includes cyber harassment, abuse, and bullying. We offer the following recommendations. One, recognize the harm caused by cyber harassment and its deep effects on students within New York City. There are 1.1 million students in the over 1,800 DOE schools, all of different backgrounds. Students of color, LGBTQ, and young women are disproportionately subjected to cyberbullying and experiencing its devastating harms. Nearly half of all lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth experience cyber harassment each year. And LGBTQ teens are three times more likely than heterosexual teens to be harassed online and are twice as likely to receive threatening har or harassing text messages. Um, studies demonstrate that students who are victims of cyber harassment report increased anxiety, depression, suicidal behavior, and psychosomatic sy symptoms. Um, one study indicates that kids who experience cyberbullying have a higher likelihood of using alcohol and drugs and experiencing health problems. Girls who are bullied are more likely to have lower GPAs and standard test scores than kids who are not bullied and they are more likely to miss, skip, or drop out of school. Two, we recommend uh, improving protocol responses by schools and Title IX coordinators and reporting procedures for victims of cyber harassment. Uh, we recommend making pr processes for students reporting cyber harassment written, explicit, and available online. As students and parents may not be familiar with the full extent of what types of acts are covered under Title IX, the Department of Education should publish Title IX pub policies online in a student and parent accessible format. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these issues. The Cyber Harassment Clinic at New York Law School would be honored to partner further with those of you who would like to examine this issue in greater detail. Good afternoon, Chair, staff members. Uh, thank you so much for holding this important hearing. 
My name is Nastya Gardelova, and I'm the Senior Coordinator of Systems and Training at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. It is due to our work with young people and with survivors of sexual violence in New York City that we find it particularly important to be here today. The Alliance leads Project DOT, a youth-led sexual violence prevention program for underserved and minority youth. Our staff and youth facilitators hold conversations with young people about healthy relationships, bystander consent, and how gender and social norms contribute to teen dating and sexual violence. Yet it's challenging for us to create safer spaces for young people to have these uh, conversations about harmful dynamics, knowing that this may not be continued in the space in which they spend the majority of their time together in their schools. But the environment can and is it can be and is a key contributing factor and can impact both prevention of violence and minimizing harm in the aftermath. Through our groups and conversations, it's consistently apparent just how much young people crave this critical information and yet lack access to it. We know that our young people are experiencing gender-based harassment and violence too young and too often. We've heard a lot of statistics today. I just want to add one that from a survey of LGBTQ-identified high school students in New York City, 24% reported being bullied on school property and nearly 20% have attempted suicide. I think it's critical that we continue remembering exactly who Title IX is trying to protect. Sexual and gender-based violence harassment create a ripple effect that permeates across individuals and systems. It does not just affect those directly involved. Our young people are constantly taking in signs and signals from their surroundings. Bystanders, friends, classmates, they're all internalizing messages, both explicit and implicit, that they receive from their teachers and their systemic school's responses. So a school's response to gender-based violence is communicating what our society values, not just to those directly involved, but to the entire school community. So we have such an opportunity for our New York City schools to demonstrate to young people that gender-based discrimination is not acceptable, harassing queer and gender non-conforming folks is not tolerated, and sexual violence will never be okay. But we do not currently have the infrastructure in New York City to support our schools with this critical task. Increasing the number of Title IX coordinators is a necessary step towards this goal. So we support Girls for Gender Equity's School, Deserve, School Girls Deserve campaign. And are calling on New York City Department of Education and City Council to expand the number of full-time Title IX coordinators and expand their roles. So that all students in New York City have the right to accommodations, trained and skilled adults to report violence to, clear education about their existing Title IX rights, and access to inclusive prevention education. Thank you for holding these hearings and giving us the opportunity. I, we're taking notes from what you're all recommending and uh, from your testimony today. So thank you so much for that. One quick question. You referenced a 2015 study. Could you send over to the committee the citation for that? Yes, absolutely. Um, and some of the other statistics. This was terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for staying. Of course. We're going to call up the next panel. Leslie Wright, Greg Waltman, Ronald Schneider, Wanda Rosario, Cartagena, uh, Mario Jean, and Marie um, Porcalis. Is, with the uh, buses? Um, no, that's fine. Why don't you speak last? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, anyone who wants to talk about the bus company issue, if they could just hold out. And uh, anyone else who wants to talk about Title IX, if you could go first. So, is everyone here on the bus issue? No, you are. Okay, if you could start. Good afternoon, Chair uh, Rosenthal, um, Chair Barron, Greg Waltman from G1 Quantum, again, here. Um, it was interesting to hear all the testimony from all the panelists and everybody that participated today in trying to flush out new ways to find different types of data points to be able to address these issues in the proper context. I think that that was um, maybe an internal type of uh, director from uh, perhaps the chancellor's office regarding the DOD to, to kind of put that all together in type of aggregate where you have real-time data to address the, the, the results would be 
obviously, from the testimony today, very important. Um, but I, I, from, from aside from that and, and the positive things to take away from there, um, I wanted to address this and try to kind of parse in um, the Green New Deal to an extent. So taking a step back from a federal level, we have um, Anita, you have Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas. Um, and in those types of contexts where you, you know, things aren't very clear, you can easily kind of fall down uh, a rabbit hole of somewhat of a, of a witch hunt where you, you can't really see up from down or where things go. And, and, and if there isn't data to support one way or the other, it becomes kind of, um, you know, an issue that doesn't reach clarity. And, and when, I, when I say that in a $14 billion Green New Deal rabbit hole, you know, I've been talking for quite, quite some time now on um, different types of climate initiatives. Like I said, putting solar panels on the border wall. If you're gonna have a border wall, you might as well create energy from it. And to talk about a $14 billion Green New Deal and then not articulate any point on these different types of solar applications, whether it be the US-Mexico border wall, is just completely disingenuous and in line with the value-based hyper-protectionism, wire fraud, and the rabbit hole that I was alluding to, where sometimes people become lost within those types of narratives, and they're not able to see through the value imposing upon the council, or whether it be the government in that type of capacity, to be able to um, reset relations to have you know a type of normalized dialogue that supports you know both parties types of position so I just wanted to bring that to the council's attention I appreciate um, chair Rosenthal's time chair Barron's time I wish chair Traeger and chair Lander had a little bit more time to to hear me out on that because week after week month after month it seems that these issues aren't being addressed thank you We'll turn now to the issue of the school buses, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank you, council members, for inviting us here today because of employment protection provisions and for the resolution that you have introduced. My name is Mario Jean. I'm here to ask you to reinstate the EPP which is the employment protection provisions. As a bus driver for the past 25 years, EPP means everything to me. In 25 years, I've been to six different companies. Because of EPPs, I was able to keep all my benefits at each. For example, Atlantic Express had over 2,000 members before they went out of business. And uh, because of EPPs, all professional drivers and matron were able to follow the works at various uh, companies that have EPPs. EPP means trust between drivers and parents. Without EPPs, the industry will become a revolving door, meaning professional drivers and matron will be forced to leave. If a child gets sick on the bus, the matron has to go to the, accompany the child to the hospital and wait for the parents to show up regardless of the time. We do care for the kids, and, uh, and, the, and we make sure that the kids get to school safe, and, uh, and that's why I'm here today to ask you to please reinstate the EPP for the bus drivers and uh, parents, and also for the safety of our kids, and uh, it's the security of the drivers. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
I'm, thank you. I'm thanking you, first of all. I'm thanking the, today's resolution to call on the lawmakers to pass the EPP. Thank you, Council Member Baron and Rosenthal for listening to us. My name is Murray Pluricles, and I'm a proud parent and member of the ATU 1181. For about 27 years, I've been in this industry. I climbed the ladder. I was a mission first. I became driver, and I love my job. I love the children, first of all. Uh, we call them our precious cargo. We are the first face that they see in the morning and the last that they see when they leave the bus. They are used to us. We are taking care of special needs children, autistic, uh, disabled. Well, we don't call them in there like that anymore. But they are very special and interesting. Once they see us, they are used to us. They are familiar to our face. They smile. Even they don't talk. They try to. They don't. They are not shy anymore. Parents see the difference. Once they leave the bus, if there is something, they question us. What happened? What's going on? If there is a change in them, that's because of probably of the way we greet them, we welcome them, and we take care of them. They feel safe under our care. Because of uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, decision in 2012 to end the EPP in the bus contract, we are suffering. We have no EPP. We are supposed to go and as shapes. Imagine after 27 years, we've been shaping for years already. The money was not great. Now that we are trying to stand on our feet, we are losing it. The EPP means to us stability in wages, benefits. With the EPP, I can affirm to my family that, okay, once, if something happens, I get sick or I'm getting too old, I cannot work, you can rely on the money, on the EPP. But without it, I, cannot, I don't know anymore. I don't know what the future will bring to us. I'm telling you, I feel, I believe, because I believe in my creator, in God, but sometimes you wonder what's going on, what's going to happen, because we're suffering. We were supposed to get our wage for uh, Easter. No, we don't have the PP. We got only one, one check, and that's not the way it's been. Uh, I don't know anymore, as I said, if we get let, laid off or if we get let go, we don't get called. But with the EPP, once something happens, once we get off, we go to another company because the company that we were at closed the door for some reason or not. We get reported to another company, no question asked. No question asked. And I'm telling you, I'm very grateful for it. I'm very, very thankful for the EPP because 27 years, as I always said, is not 27 days because of the EPP. I lasted so long. I hope, and I'm still, since I look still young and I feel young, I feel very energetic, still able to work, I hope that I can continue doing what I love, taking care of our precious cargo, the children, the New York City's children. Mm. Also, as, a, as I said, I've been a matron and a driver. I climbed the ladder, as I said, again, I desperately need to keep the job. That is why I'm telling you, I am grateful and thankful for you to listen in to us, trying to help us out in this matter. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Education Committee. My name is Wanda Rosario Cartagena. I'm a bus driver for 14 years, over 14 years. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to us. Um, I'm so hurt because I give to this community. I give my time, my work. Um, 
and I'm very proud of what I do. I'm a bus driver, and I'm happy to have this uniform every day. But I want you guys to see behind this uniform. I'm a parent. I'm a grandmother. I'm a see. I'm a man. I'm a, I'm from this community. Um, four years ago, I have a grandson that he is disabled, and riding these buses every day. I feel that the same opportunity I give to all the kids to be safe and be go be able to go to school in time and be there for them. My grandson and all the kids deserve the same opportunity. Because of the, the decision in Mayor Bloomberg to eliminate the EPP in 2012, uh, industry be a chaos. Um, okay, us. the strike, it was the first one in 33 years. Because of May Mayor Bloomberg's decision, now on experience, on the pay, and on the train bus drivers are taking and transporting our children. I feel that my grandson, just like every other kid in this community, need our experience, need us, need new drivers to have the same opportunity that we have 14, 20, 30 years ago with the EPP. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Ron Schneider, and I've spent the last four hours and four and a half hours cutting my remarks down in half, but that half will still leave me over two minutes, and I hope you'll indulge me for that reason and also because I believe I'm the only one here um, speaking in opposition to the proposed resolution. I um, am the attorney who did the initial drafting for most of the legal documents submitted by the bus companies in their successful lawsuit that prevented the OE's attempt to reimpose the EPP. As a result, I'm very familiar um, with the various issues involving the EPPs. I'm also a resident of New York City, and as a taxpayer, I'm disappointed, disappointed in a number of things. I'm disappointed, one, for the record, that if my eyes don't just see me, we have two council members and two staff members here out of all these committees on this resolution that will still take in this testimony it's, and have a chance to talk about it and ask questions. And that's a disappointment that that's the process that's going here through here when the committee is going to propose, you know, pass judgment on a resolution, that that's all the people willing to take this input in this manner. Um, I'm also disappointed that, once again, it appears that the committee members have allowed, or at least a portion of the committee members have allowed, the interest supporting the EPPs to pull the wool over the eyes about what's really at stake here and what EPPs really do and don't do. There's no doubt um, that a lot of the things that the uh, proponents are proposing or as results of EPPs are good things. But the question is whether or not the EPPs are the things that cause those good things. And the reality is that the arguments that of that causation effect relies on false narratives, misdirections, and in some cases outright lies. Now, given the time, I do not have the time to even begin to go through all of those failings. But it's just one simple quick example. Let me give this. Um, arguments are made that to point to all the problems with school busing, and no one denies that there are lots of problems with school busings, including safety issues. And then the advocates cry out, do it for the children, assuming that if we just had EPPs, things would be better, the children would be safe. Of course, everyone wants a safe and reliable busing system for the children, but the problems that have occurred have nothing to do with EPPs or not having EPPs. The example is just given here about a matron staying um, to go to with a sick child to a hospital, and a matron and a driver being the first person they see and the last person they see. Those things are true whether there are EPPs or not. Matrons in non -EPP contract, under non-EPP contracts do those things as well. They're not EPP pro or not. In fact, all of the instances that I've been made aware of that hit the newspaper over the last year with safety issues that came up were involved companies that are under EPP contracts, that have EPP contracts, and none of those issues involve companies that didn't have EPPs. So if anything, the evidence is that EPPs foster these problems, not prevent these problems. More generally, if you really want to get into the specifics of the lack of causation between it, you need to get into the details and read some of the arguments in the court papers. There's been two litigations on this matter, and there's lots of court papers that have spent much more time than these few minutes here today to get into it. Read the court decisions. 
But putting those issues aside, what I really want to focus my time on today, is at least about two and a half more minutes, is something that's even more insidious has come up, something that's even found its way into the proposed resolution as one of the whereas clauses. And that's the idea that these purported benefits from EPPs are cost-free, that we live in a wonderland where we can sprinkle a little fairy dust and get something for free. We can have our cake and eat it too. Of course, in the real world, there is not any fairy dust. Instead, what we have is a paid for consultant that prepared a supposed comprehensive analysis to reach the desired result that we can have all these benefits for free. And wow, save $288 million too. The result of this so-called Cherrydale report is absurd on its face. Accordingly, it is not surprising, surprising that if you actually look at it with the knowledge of the background, such as I have from working on this issue and litigating it, that it is full of one-sided conjecture, misdirection, falsehoods, and ridiculous premises, and ignores the actual evidence. In a moment, I'll, I'll highlight just a couple of those things, but there are two reasons why you shouldn't dismiss this absurd assertion out of hand. First, the question of whether the EPP saved the public money has been litigated fully twice, and both times the courts of this state concluded that there was no evidence that the EPP saved money. The courts found that EPPs were atypical anti-competitive provisions that are not found anywhere else in this country. And as a result, they were subject to heightened scrutiny under which the DOE had to demonstrate that the EPP saved money. Both times, the courts found that the DOE did not do so. They had two chances to show the EPP saved money, and the courts ruled twice that they didn't do so. Who are you going to believe? The, a one-sided paid-for consultant or an adversarial process following defined procedures in the independent, unbiased, neutral court system. Furthermore, the result that the EPPs do not save money was not just from a random judge or two, but a total of 18 judges unanimously, without dissent, reached this conclusion after considering evidence in an adversarial proceeding. 18 independent judges or one paid for consultant. Who are you going to believe? Second. Yes, I just skipped a whole page. <laughs> um, second, the empirical evidence, and I'll skip another page right here. The empirical evidence shows that the costs are real. This council um, in, 19, or in 2014 passed a grant program to reimburse contractors who won contracts without EPPs if they paid their workers as though there were EPPs. In other words, the exact cost of EPPs. And those costs have reimbursements have been 30 to $35 million a year for just the 11% of bus routes covered by that, which means you have empirical, actual evidence of what the costs really are, 30 to $35 million a year for 11% of routes. That translates over five years for all routes into one bill, more than well over $1 billion. And so the idea that this study comes up and you put in a whereas clause in the resolution that this is going to save money when the actual evidence is that it's cost a billion dollars a year is absurd. A couple examples, the Terrydale study ex uh, um, doesn't consider and just wash brushes to the side the actual empirical evidence. The Terrydale study says no longer paying this grant money will be a savings, yet that's three-card money. It just means it will be paid under the um, higher costs from the contracts instead of the grant program. Third, the Terry Dell study says that you'll save $100 million by not paying for withdrawal liability, but the federal courts have already ruled all the way up to the Second Circuit that the city is not liable for withdrawal liability. You can't save money to the city under this program if the city isn't obligated to pay it. In sum, there's absolutely no doubt that the EPP's costs not save money, and the empirical evidence indicates the cost is well over a billion dollars over five years. As illustrated by the example, um, EPPs do not result in the claimed benefits. But even if you're taking in by the honeyed words of the interest supporting EPPs and believe otherwise, at least be honest um, and realize the billion dollar cost of seeking these purported benefits and make sure you're willing to pay that billion dollar cost before you vote for that resolution. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. If you could send over to the committee um, the uh, information about the companies that had EPPs and still had problems at the beginning of the school year 2018. That would be very okay. interesting. Who do I direct that to? Uh, or is there an email address? We'll or? give you a card. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And also, in your opening remarks, you cited that there were only two of us here and 
to council here. I do want to make you aware that this is a matter of public record and those members who are not here oftentimes go back and review the documentation as well as the text so that they become familiar with what it was that transpired in the hearing. And I hope they do and, and trust what they will. It's just an appearance issue of nothing else to the public where there's you know, many, many people sitting here for five hours, but only two council people could sit here for the same five hours. It's just a little disconcerting. Um, thank you all for coming and testifying today. We really appreciate your time and thank you for your patience right. for waiting until um, we were able to clarify uh, some other issues that we were talking about at this hearing tonight. Thanks. So thank you for that. I just want to confirm, uh, is Leslie Wright here? Didn't want to miss her. Okay. Thank you all. Um, this was an incredibly informative hearing. Um, for me, I think, again, the testimony from the high school students who summed up what consent means so eloquently and were able to articulate why they didn't feel safe in an environment where a teacher tells them to put cardboard underneath their ripped jeans um, was the most persuasive evidence um, for why we need a comprehensive Title IX program in the schools. I think that the um, programs and processes that CUNY uh, delivered today were excellent models mm -hmm. that could be replicated. And I do think we owe it to our 1.1 million school children to think harder about what we could be doing to protect them uh, from the minute they walk in the door uh, to the end of the school day. So thank you, everyone, for your testimony today. More likely than not, we will be having a follow-up hearing. Thank you. Hearing is closed.